and we call to order the City Council meeting and we do for our agenda this is the open session the beginning of the open session of the City Council meeting could we please call the roll City Council Council Agency member Martner Council Agency member Costa present Council Agency member Starbuck present Mayor Pro Tem Vice Chair Lingle here Mayor Chair John Lynn here okay this is a our first oral communication of the evening it's your opportunity to address the council on any subject of your choice seeing no one rise we'll close oral communication and we'll move to a closed session in the come on down Oh, speaker's card? Yeah. Step up and just set, tell us your name. Come right up. Yeah, and now we're going to have main council session after this. Did you want to do it when the whole audience was here, or did you want to do it now? The main council session starts at 7, but we have to open this and then go to our closed session and then come back. doesn't matter to me. Go ahead on. Um, my name is Chris Bennett. Um, I was wondering if we could, uh, if you would consider... I guess redefining the the city ordinance about having chickens. Um, it's I guess there's no life. The chickens are considered livestock in the city of Lompoc. Um, then I started doing some research and found out that Lompoc is the only city in Santa Barbara County that doesn't allow chickens. Um, I don't know if there's any anything that could be done about that. Um, in answer to your question is the council passes those ordinances and has the ability to modify them mm -hmm. um, what you might what might be helpful to us <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> if you want to be the research guy for all of us would be to get a a poll of kind of what the other cities allow and show us an ordinance from one of them that's well written I have all of them you're the man <laughs> so what you would need to do is pass them over to Stacy and she would duplicate them and give them to us and then you would need to tell her if you wanted your originals back or not okay I don't think so okay and then um, if you want to uh, see me after we get done talking I'll give you my email you can you can email me and then I'll tell you how we're doing with it okay 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 thank you you're not the first person that's asked me by the way but it's nice you did the work is there anyone else that would like to speak butcher you're not going to speak again are you no okay all right so now we'll adjourn to the closed session in the utility conference room to meet with our labor negotiators Good evening and welcome to the Lompoc City Council meeting. Is this louder than usual or is it just me? Okay. Get further away. Um, we, had an, we had a closed session prior to this and we had a discussion with our labor negotiator and we have no reportable actions. It was just an ongoing discussion. And oh yes, and we didn't finish that discussion and after we get done with y'all, We'll be going back there and talking some more, and then we'll come back here one more time in case any of you want to stay and see us after that so we can let you know if there's any reportable actions, and I think I can guess in advance that there won't be, knowing where the conversation was. And now we have the invocation from Mike Cunningham or John Lynn. Okay. Dear God, thank you for our wonderful community. As I spent time at the uh, Relay for Life opening ceremonies, I was reminded again of what it is that is so special about our community, and that is all of our volunteers. And I ask that you bless and keep them in their efforts to help our community each and every day. Uh, that you would bless and keep this council in our efforts to provide the very best government to our community and our audience for coming here and helping us this evening with that. Amen. And if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag 
of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Better get a sermon together. Next week, we will have Reverend Lingle in her next meeting if we, if we have a miss. Okay. And this evening, I have a proclamation that I don't have. Ah, okay. It's a pro- proclamation presented elsewhere. Better. On May 12th, a proclamation in honor of National Police Week. Police Week, Police Officers Memorial Day was given to Police Chief Timothy Dabney. And and then now we have something really good. Uh Uh-oh. Here we go. We have an important presentation. Shirley Tognetti, where are you? There you are. (laughs) Shirley Tognetti was appointed to the Human Services Commission in January of 1999. Since that time, Commissioner Tognetti provided hundreds, probably thousands of hours of service to the commission, researching social service issues affecting Lompoc residents, and providing insightful observations from her own life experiences. Commissioner Tognetti spearheaded the commission's creation of a tap TV show, The Lompoc Showcase, in 2007. This cable TV show, came about because Commissioner Tognetti saw a need for social service agencies to communicate directly with community residents and provide information on services and resources. Commissioner Tognetti produced and taped 28 shows. And speaking from personal experience, that's a lot like work. Covering a range of topics which were broadcast broadcast to all Comcoast households in Lompoc, and the San Inez Valley. And now we have a presentation for you. Yes, but it has a very smooth finish, and it's very easy to dust. And I have it on good authority that we coated it with pledge before we gave it to you. You are now forced to say something. Oh, gosh. When I started... um Human Services Uh, in that year, they walked in the room and held in their hand this great big four-inch booklet. And I'm thinking to myself, if I were sitting on the other side of the table where the door is, I'd be out of there. (laughs) Because it was just too much. Of course, it's, it's still much, but Pretty soon you get to know all the people that you're working with, and it's easier that way. Thank you so very much. Your services will be missed, but we know you'll be around helping us too. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you for all your time. Okay. And now the city administrator's executive director's status report. Honorable mayor, city council members, audience and viewers. The city administrator's status report includes project status uh, reports on three city projects, the Dick DeWeese Community and Senior Center, 
the Lompoc Aquatic Center dehumidification project and the installation of a traffic signal at the intersection of Ocean Avenue and R Street. Uh, tonight, Senior Civil Engineer Mike Luther is available to give an oral report on uh, these three projects, and I invite Mr. Luther to the podium. Good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor and Council. If I may, I would like to also make two other announcements regarding the recently completed Allen Hancock bike project. Uh, first of all, the Parks and Recreation and Urban Forestry Department are planning a dedication ceremony for next Wednesday, May 25th at 4 p.m. We invite the public to come out and uh, participate in that. That will be held at the uh, northern entrance to the bike path at the south end of the Allen Hancock campus. And uh, secondly, I'd like to announce that uh, as part of National Public Works Week last week, uh, the California Central Coast chapter has an annual awards ceremony and the project won project of the year for transportation projects under $2 million. And the award is displayed out in the lobby as part of the uh, public works display. So moving on to the uh, project updates, I'd like to start with the intersection, traffic signal intersections for R and 246. The uh, status report prepared by uh, Chuck Haight indicated we were waiting on Caltrans to authorize our agreement. As of yesterday, the, uh, we received the authorization to proceed with preliminary engineering from Caltrans. At that time, we issued our request for qualifications for engineering services, began the advertisement for that, and those statements of qualification are due on June 2nd. If there's any questions on that one, I'll, I can answer them. Okay, I'll move on to the uh, Aquatic Center dehumidification project. The uh, project is currently about 75% through the contract days. There have been no contract uh, payment requests to date, which is a little surprising, but the contractor, we can't pay him if he doesn't request payment, so. <laughs> Anyway, that's, uh, and there have been uh, no contract change orders issued, although several items have been identified, minor little change orders that will be coming up. Um, but as you can see from the April's construction report, progress is, is progressing nicely. To date, there have been uh, no disruptions of any scheduled activities in the pool. There is a scheduled closure for this Thursday, May 19th. The pool will be closed to the public all day. This closure is needed due to the replacement of the existing electrical transformer. In order to replace the transformer, the power needs to be cut to the facility for an extended period of time. Uh, during the closure, the contractor is planning on performing other items of work to reduce future impacts of the facility, which includes tying in to the pool water return lines, and other plumbing system tie-ins. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Department has, to notify the public on this, has had several press releases in the local paper, radio, and news stations, posted the closure at the facility and announced the closure during classes and discussed closure in their weekly radio show on AM 1440. No further closures of the facility are anticipated at this time. Um, Mike, could you just make a comment on what corrosion we found and whether it was greater or lesser than was originally anticipated? Uh, as far as corrosion, it's actually probably less than we anticipated when they removed the cover plates for the um, columns. There really was no corrosion. Uh, we did locate um, some corroded bolts that weren't identified up that support the lighting system but it's just the screws. We're just gonna replace the screws. That's one of the minor change orders I was talking about. Um, but actually, as far as um, unexpected corrosion, there really hasn't been too much. Uh, as far as um, work that's taken place, actually the, the new sprinkler system piping 
is in place. It actually got uh, pressure tested today and was, um, the rough end was approved by the fire chief and he'll be, I believe he's coming out tomorrow to do a final on the fire system. So that's moving along. And as you can see from the pictures, the uh, large dehumidification units were placed earlier in April. So if there's any other questions, I can answer those. We'll move on to the senior center. The, um, that project is approximately two thirds complete on time basis and uh, less than a third on a monetary basis as far as what's been paid to the contractor. He's been paid approximately $840,000 of the contract so far. And unfortunately, this project is not progressing as smoothly as we anticipated. As you can see from the memo, uh, the project status report from Harrison Associates, the project construction manager, and, and a letter from the architect. There have been two contract change orders issued on the project. And I believe that the architect's letter describes that those issues the best. So if I could just read from that, I think it'll explain it a little bit better. So the letter from the architect reads, as you are aware, there have been two change orders issued to the general contractor on the Dewey's project, both of which have apparently been questioned by city administration and council. The two unforeseen conditions involve the north facade of the building, which I will refer to as the storefront issue, and the other issue involved the structural support of the operable partition walls, which I will refer to as the truss issue. With respect to the storefront issue, the design team had based the design on the assumption that the construction above the existing storefront was similar to that of the adjacent retail store, essentially a masonry CMU header wall directly above the storefront concealed under the overhang canopy that was to be demolished. The construction documents called for the existing masonry wall to be sandblasted and repainted to match the new building color and finish. However, once the canopy was demolished, it was evident that there was no masonry header wall above the storefront and that something would need to be constructed to close off the above ceiling space. A proposal request was issued to the general contractor to construct a stud frame wall in the place of the assumed masonry header wall, which would then be finished with stucco to match the rest of the Dewey Center. Both the general contractor and Harrison Associates provided input and several alternatives were discussed. All parties came to an agreement as to the most economical solution, which was presented to the city for approval. In all renovation projects, some existing conditions are not readily visible, and thus assumptions must be made in order to complete the bid documents. In this case, the design team assumed there was an existing structure component that could be refinished and reused as part of the final design, which was a cost-effective solution. When the actual conditions were revealed, the entire team worked together to find an effective solution. Had the actual conditions been known at the onset, the solution would have been part of the construction documents and the bid contract amount would have been higher to reflect the additional work. The design team has reviewed the proposed costs for the change order and found them to fare for increased amount of labor and material required for the solution. That is to say that the city is not suffering a premium or gouging by the general contractor due to the work being in progress. The second issue for the trusses is a little more complex, but in the end is essentially the same in that additional work and materials were required through no fault of the design team or the general contractor, thus necessitating a change order. The partition walls, both electric and manual, were a major design feature required by the ad hoc committee. I'm sorry, requested by the ad hoc committee, incorporated into the final design as approved by the city council and even survived value engineering suggestions to reduce the quality of these special walls. As noise transmission was a concern identified early in the progress, the type of operable walls were necessarily heavy. Mass is the best way to block low frequency noise transmission. Modern Fold was selected as the manufacturer for the basis of design as they have an excellent reputation in civil and municipal projects. 
In May, June 2009, KBZ worked closely with our structural engineer to study the best method of supporting these new walls as it was evident that the existing roof trusses would not support these loads. Essentially, when the walls are open, the wall panels are stacked closely together in a relatively small area. Schematic layouts of the partition walls were sent to the wall manufacturer's representative, Partition Specialties Incorporated, for review to general specific details, closet size, specifications, etc. The structural engineer then requested design criteria from the manufacturer's representative to guide his calculations and final design. The representative sent him to ASTM document showing the wall heights and the criteria for allowable deflection of the support beam. The allowable deflection is a concern because if the support beam sags too much, the wall is likely to bind up between the floor and the ceiling or the hinges become too stressed and not open closed properly. The AS team document specified an allowable beam deflection of 1 8 inch for every 12 linear feet of beam length. For reference, the longest operable wall in this project is approximately 52 feet, which would translate into approximately one half inch of allowable deflection at the center. After considering multiple methods of support and evaluating costs for the two most efficient solutions, it was determined that adding new open web trusses, a similar construction to the existing trusses was the solution with the highest value by a factor of nearly two. This solution was incorporated into the bid documents. During the construction phase, the general contractor was skeptical of the solution and had the partition manufacturer review the bid documents. It was disclosed during discussions between our structural engineer and the partition manufacturer's engineer that the original deflection criteria was incorrect and that the new criteria was 1 8 inch allowable regardless of the length of the wall. The new criteria rendered the previous wood truss solution infeasible. Several alternative solutions were reviewed by the design team, the general contractor, and the city's construction manager. It was determined that new steel trusses would be the most cost-effective method to proceed with. Our engineer, at no extra cost to the city, designed seven all steel trusses to support the partition walls to meet the new deflection criteria of 1 8 inch, absolute. The change order was sent to the city for approval. The change order that was sent to the city for approval reflects the credit back for deleting the previous design solution and new changes for incorporating the new solution. KBC and the whole design team did its due diligence in seeking out the requirements from the partition wall manufacturer and by evaluating multiple solutions in order to arrive at a design delivering the highest value to the city. It is unfortunate that the solution was rendered infeasible by a change in design criteria issued by the manufacturer. No one likes to see change orders, certainly not in these poor economic conditions. However, renovation projects always have a degree of uncertainty, much more so than greenfield construction from scratch. KBZ has been very pleased to work on this project with the city, and despite numerous increases to the scope of work, we have not requested any additional compensation with the exception of the study required by Council of the Alternative Convention Center Plan in January 2009. We are committed to seeing this project through to successful completion and occupancy and hope that our efforts towards that end are appreciated. So that was a letter from uh, Todd Jesperson of KBZ. Although the memo indicates that there have been no contract uh, time extensions granted to the prime contractor, it is anticipated that he will be entitled to some time extension due to this change in the scope of work that uh, the impact of that hasn't totally been discovered or actually analyzed at this time. Uh, an update on the trusses is they are in production right now and the current the last schedule I heard as of last Friday was they were to be delivered to the site next week. Just um, as a recap for everybody I recall when we were discussing with the alternate floor plan the need the, the, for putting in, if, if we in fact use moving walls, and Todd talked about the fact that a moving wall requires a stiffening of the ceiling, so they were they were aware of this, and, and I we would appear they've done their due diligence. Um, I guess my question would be, 
if we had um, received the appropriate information and placed these designs in the original design package and installed them in our due course of construction rather than doing it the way we're doing it now, would there been, have been any substantial cost savings? Or is this pretty much what we would have paid anyway? That's speculative. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, you would hope that if it was included in the original bid, it would be cheaper originally. Okay, so now we're asking <laughs> for your speculation. Do you think there's a substantive cost difference? I, I wouldn't think it would be more than 10% difference. Okay. And, and I guess the way my mind is running is the, um, the manufacturer of the wall specified a spec sheet which the architect used and then well, it was actually a sales consultant for the manufacturer and, okay yeah. so the sales consultant specified a spec sheet a design sheet which the architect then relied on reasonably yes and then it came back around and if it cost us more I think we need to go back to the sales consultant and ask for our money that's the way I would look at it it was it was not the architect's mistake it was not the engineer's mistake it was surely not the contractor's mistake it was the uh, sale consultant's mistake yeah that may that would have to be something that we'd have to explore with our legal counsel tag mr mayor i understand your comments i think it's best to not have those kinds of discussion as we're sitting here in public i guess you're talking to the attorney later aren't you Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Luther, you're just a messenger, so I, I understand that. Uh, I'm not upset. I'm, I'm a little um, disappointed that we're seeing some change orders. We're seeing a possible additional time on this project. I remember when the we got these bids. I think we had three bids, and all bids all the bids were under what we even anticipated them to be. Is that correct? I remember people telling me at that time, Bob, be careful. If they're that far under what you anticipated, you're going to see a bunch of change orders, and now we're starting to see them. And I'm just hoping we're not going to see a bunch more later on. But my question to you is, and you're just a messenger, so I'm not doing this. The word assumed was used several times. They assumed the walls had the structures in there. They assumed this, they assumed that. The other bids that we had received, did they address the issue that the walls did not have the proper um, structure in there? Do you, do you recall if they, well, the other bids is, had that? This was a letter from the design yeah. architect, not the bidder. Okay, so the other bids would have gone on the same information. They all, they all were bid on the same bid documents. Okay. Um, okay, so we, in our estimate of this, and the amount that we approved, we also have in there a certain amount for contingencies for overruns. Do you know what percent this is going to take up of the? Uh, these two change orders combined is approximately 3.7%. Uh, okay, so not, a, not really significant then at this point? No. Okay. And the time delay, speculation, do you have any idea what the time delay will be? Have they given you any indication? Well, I mean, he's obviously going to ask for the most time he can, and we're going to try to limit that. So I would, if I'm going to guess, I'm going to say a month and a half. Okay. Um, my suggestion is you work as much as possible to shorten it. The community has been waiting seven years for this project. Yeah, and that's why we directed him to proceed with work while we were negotiating the contract. Yeah, I appreciate that. Change sure. order. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Mayor? Councilmember Lingle. I'm sorry, and I just want to uh, thank the city administrator for providing us with these updates. It's, I know it's an extra work, but I, th I feel it's been very helpful for me I'm assuming the public appreciates it too, so thank you. And staff requests and announcements. Mr. Mayor and Council, I just advise that on your consent calendar item number four, 
is staff's report to renew the agreement with the Santa Barbara County to continue contracting for animal control services during fiscal year 11-12 in the amount of 242707 uh, budgeted in account number 18900-53415. And uh, city, uh, with council's adoption of the consent calendar tonight, uh, you will authorize the city administrator to execute this one-year agreement. And with regard to that amount compared to prior years? It's uh, status quo, same uh, contract amount we paid for this current year. Thank you. And... Council Development Agency requests and announcements. Anyone have anything at the front end they want to do? Nope. Okay, down to down at the back end. So now we have our main oral communications period to talk about anything you want to talk about that's not on the agenda later, or if there's something that's on the agenda really late and you'd like to speak and go home, we'd be happy to listen to you on that. And that's what makes it a great town. Hi -ho. I'm Salty Huncherich, and I use the aquatic center six days a week for both water exercises and slow lap swimming. I'm well aware at my advanced age that the only constant in life is change, and nobody likes change. And in the locker room at the aquatic center, the place has been a Twitter over this, are we going to be under the wise? guidance, or are we going to maintain our own center, what's happening? And here are some of the questions that I'd like to pose to you. Um, one of them is, will the wise staffing, what will the wise staffing levels be? Will there be same or greater safe lifeguard levels? Presently, our guards change every 15 minutes. This is to keep them awake, active focused. When I used to go to the municipal pool, there'd be one lifeguard for the whole period, and they'd kind of zone out. And this way, we keep things active and more focused. And I, we certainly would like that to remain. Uh, also, there'll be the same or greater uh, cleaning personnel performance. Presently, you walk in and the place looks good. Because we are taxpayers and we help pay for it, I know I personally, if I see something amiss, I'll either report it immediately or I'll pick it up myself. No problem, because it belongs to me. It belongs to the community. Okay, second question. Will the programs that I participate in remain this, uh, the same or be impacted by new Y programs? Will the Y honor the aquatic center's agreements with the local schools for the polo play, with the adaptive program for the handicapped, for the mentally retarded, the um, adult ed, the, even we have a program with a local s scuba shop that come and practice. Uh, most of all, my pleasure is the baby swim with the little kids. I mean, they're tiny. If any of you have a chance, come down on a Saturday morning and watch these kids. It's amazing the way the parents participate. And, and it, it just has a, the whole ambiance is Lompoc, you know, love and da-da-da. It's, it's great. Okay, three. What will my access to the facility be? Will I have to become a Y member? I already belong to Walnut Pier. I've been there forever. Why would I want to take my business away from them? Presently, I pay, uh, my, of course, my fees to Walnut Pier, but for the Aquatic Center, I pay $25 a month for unlimited lap swim. The Y's 
a fee structure, to my understanding, is I think $32 for seniors, which I am. And um, if you don't belong, it, it costs $10 each time you go in. There are a couple of people who live in Carpinteria who come to our place because they like it. They like the whole ambiance of the one-on-one -on -one with the guards. There's a, a woman I know of who lives in San Ernest, but the why there, their, their pool is so clo cold, she can't go there, so she comes to our place. Five, the Lompoc Aquatic Center is the city's newest and best facility. Something for us to be proud of. Something that we as taxpayers have paid for, and we don't want to give it up. We really don't. Because it belongs to us, we take pride in it. It's part of our community. We're the ones teaching the, the new little tiny kids how to swim. We're the ones teaching the younger kids how to swim so that everyone in the community will, will feel safe. And we just hope that it continues that way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, just a comment, no, you wouldn't have to be a Y member to participate. Oh. That, I, that I can tell you with certainty. And I am collecting all these questions from everybody that talks about it to uh, use when it comes around to talking to them. Because all we've done so far is ask them to give us a, some thoughts on it. Yeah. There's no decision has been made. We're, we're a long ways from well, that. Well, the thing is, presently, you know, we've had the same supervisor, I guess, since the poll started. And they've improved. If, if we as members say something, they'll usually try to, you know, fix it if we see something is wrong. And to bring in some inexperienced person who hasn't had the experience of about four or five years, it's going to be stressful. So, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Next. Good evening. My, my name is Bob Doherty. I'm an off the pain medication mostly. I'm one of the owners of American Star Transportation. I would hey. like to begin with offering my appreciation. Hey, Bob. Yeah. Um, do you want to hold on till we get to that item? This was just an opening statement I was going to make. You, you can want? do it then. Okay. You can go the whole distance. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good evening, Council Mayor. Jason Reynolds, Longpoke Valley Chamber of Commerce. Just stopped by to, uh, this tonight. Um, wanted to give you guys a quick confirmation. Um, we wanted to confirm with the Council um, the Chamber will be present um, at the June 7th Council meeting uh, to discuss the budgetary issues. Um, if there's any, any, any info that's needed uh, prior to that, uh, please discuss that with us. You know how to get a hold of us. And uh, we'd be happy to, to work with you. But we will be present um, on the 7th, and uh, we'll be ready. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Seeing no one rise, we'll move oral communications and we'll come back to the consent calendar. This evening we have a large consent calendar. We have the approval of the minutes for the regular meeting of May 3rd. We have approval of the expenditures, a, a payroll voucher and two expense vouchers. If there is an item on there payable to my corporation, I hereby abstain from that item and I didn't see one. We have the approval of resolution 572011 for proposition 1B California Transit Security Grant Program application and that's a recommendation that the city adopt this resolution and authorize the city administrator to file and execute the necessary documents for the purpose of obtaining financial assistance provided by the California Emergency Management Agency for transportation security. We have the renewal of the agreement with the County of Santa Barbara Animal Control, the city administrator spoke about previously, which is a status quo cost. We have resolution 5717, denying the appeal submitted by Robert Cuthbert on behalf of the Citizens Against Walmart Expansion, CWE of the Planning Commission determination of February 9th, 2011 and adopting resolution 683 sub 11 approving the development plan DR 0809 for the Walmart expansion project. 
We have a cell site licensing agreement at the water treatment plant. And this is an agreement which is substantially similar to other agreements that we have at other locations in Lompoc with Verizon Wireless. And then we have council support of SB 356. And this is a letter supporting Senate Bill 356 from Senator Blakely, which empowers local communities to protect their state parks from closure. We're happy to report that, at least for now, the La Parisma mission is not on the closure list. However, this was to help other municipalities with the approximately 100 state parks that are going to close so that either the city or the county or another local government agency could take over a state park and operate it until the state was ready to take it back. And that's the consent calendar. Are there any items that someone would like to have withdrawn? Okay, and is there any discussion about this? If not, I'd accept a motion. Councilmember Costa. I move to approve the consent calendar. And a second. I second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion or review? Seeing no lights, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. For those of you who are new with us, um, the, the full extent of all of these is provided to us in our council notebook, and if you wanted to look at them in the future, they are available. The full text of each one of them is available on the website. The items on the consent calendar are considered fairly routine in nature, or they're the final reading of something that we have previously worked on in the case of the, the um, denying the appeal with regard to the Walmart. And now we move to our first public hearing item. And this is a hearing of objections to destroy weeds, remove rubbish, refuse, and dirt. And so now we have our fire marshal, Robert Kovac. Has anybody objected to removing the weeds that we're aware of? Uh, no, sir. Okay, I'm going to start out with that. The new shorter list and what he's passing out is the list of properties that have not abated their weeds since they got their first and second letters it's a much shorter list okay honorable mayor council members uh, members of the public again my name is Robert Kovac fire marshal city of Lompoc um, we are here for hearing of objections to destroy weeds and remove rubbish, refuge, and dirt. Um, I'm going to start with the recommendation. Recommendation that the City Council hold a public hearing to receive comments and information from the public to show cause why nuisance conditions upon subject property should not be abated. Adopt Resolution 571611, ordering the Fire Chief to abate such nuisances as declared April 19th, 2011 by Resolution 571211 in the time manner provided by law. So let me just uh, summarize. We started with 107 uh, properties in town that we sent an initial courtesy letter to. That dropped down to 54 actual violation letters went out to those properties. And out of those 54, we still have 28 parcels remaining that uh, need to comply. Out of those 28, there's actually 13 owners. Uh, so there's multiple parcels owned by the same property owners and tonight is for any of those property owners to uh, come up for any public hearing or comments on their properties before we move forward with the remaining 28 and that ends my report if you have any questions um, I'd like to ask you a question about the second to the last property on um, page one which would be 1416 East Walnut Avenue is that the, the lot on the corner of Walnut and 7th Yes, sir. It's, um, it's fenced in a lot. Yeah. Um, when there was demolition going on there many years ago, I don't know how many now, um, several roll-offs were loaded with demolition materials. And um, for whatever reason, I think I can guess, the when the roll-offs were picked up, the debris was dumped, and it's been... One is a pile of wood and one is a pile of concrete and the other one's just a pile of mess. Is there any possibility we could encourage them 
through this process to clean up their long-term mess? Yeah, absolutely. In addition to the weeds, we could, you know, declare the debris or the dirt on the lot as a public nuisance too, so that would fall right into that category. Yeah, it's been an attractive nuisance for kids forever, and I've personally had lots of comments from the neighbors. Okay. Plus, it's across from our nice brand new hospital, and it's kind of ugly. Correct. Okay. Um, do you need a, any recommendation from the council, or can you just deal with it? Uh, no, the recommendation was to hold the public hearing for comments right now, and then adopt resolution 571611. Then we need to make an amendment for you to do something about this, or can you just take it in your normal course of action? Normal course of action is okay. Fine. Thank you, Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, I, the one of the properties that is no longer on the list is at the. It's on Ocean Avenue, East Ocean, the very intersection of the city. Um, there's a big tree that's been down for years. The tree is still there. Correct. Okay. Yeah, they did clear the lot. They right. took care of the, the tree. We have made contact with that owner. There is some plans to remove that tree, so we'll recontact the owner. He did contact us and say his plans was to have that tree cut up and hauled away. Okay. Can you get some sort of a deadline from him? I can get that, yeah. We can okay. recontact the owner on that. Okay, thank you. And, you know, just as an indication, I know it's the property on South Sea, the one that we had problems with last time. An indication that this program is working, that property looks pretty good right now. This is uh, the second time around. They did have to clean it up the second time, but it never got nearly as bad as it did the first time. So okay. the good. program works, so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have some more technical style questions. Um, what is the average cost to abate one of these properties? Um, from last year, uh, if you give me one second, I'll find that. Sure. Um, it goes by the size of the lot. Right. And um, let's see if I can find the exact amount from that, what we did last year on those. It is, and I may not have brought that with me tonight, so I apologize if I don't have that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't actually bring that document with me. Tonight. I think help is coming. Put it on, put it on, put it on, put it Chief States handled that last year, so you might have that. You say they went from an average of 368 was the cheapest up to a little over 4,000. Three hundred and sixty dollars to four thousand dollars, depending yeah. on the property. And four thousand was for a twenty-acre parcel. Right. Okay. Thank you for that information. I really appreciate that. Thank 368 you. Three hundred and sixty-eight was on uh, East Ocean, between the house and the medical building. Mm -hmm. okay. Twelve hundred block. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other questions I had were, um, I'm, thank you so much for this updated uh, list. I did have people contacting me saying that they had since then um, abated the weeds, so I'm glad we got this and they're off that list. Um, but when was this uh, update done? Uh, two days ago, I went and surveyed all the lots, and so our secretary built that list actually today from my survey two days ago. Wonderful. Um, and again, I'm glad we went from 48 cases down to 28. Is uh, because I, this is my first exposure to this side of the process. Um, is it unusual to have so many active cases, or is this a, a about average when we do this? No, last year we uh, I think we had 17, but this year we did send notices to more lots, so it's it's pretty average. Okay. And then the last question I had for you is how many letters were sent to each individual property owner? Well, the first letter was sent uh, as a, it, that was the courtesy letter, and then there was a second notice sent with the deadline of May 10th, um, and then we will contact them one more time for these 28 before we actually uh, move forward with the abatement. So three separate times of contact then? Correct, yes. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Is there anyone in the public that would like to speak on this issue? Come on down. Thank you, Council. Uh, my name is Paul Rosso. 
Um, my concern is I didn't have availability of the list, and I have a property near me which has been notorious for the last five years plus, and I want to ensure that that property is on the list. What's the address, Paul? Six Santa Clara. You've been there. Uh, yeah, I know. I just wanted you to say it. It is. Is that on the list? Is this a vacant lot or an no, existing home? It's existing home. Okay. That, that would be a separate list. This is for, regarding vacant lots and, and certain identified properties, so that's a different process for, for an existing home. How structure. about if you two get together and get it on the list? Uh, yeah, I've talked to this gentleman before, and I don't. I, I'm going to Go make ahead, a Paul. comment about the specific property, which you're familiar with. Yes. Uh, this is a notorious property. Um, when the person clears it, they weed whack it, and I wind up with all their debris on my property, which I have a fairly well-maintained lawn, and it it's just creates weeds in my property. And it's a tremendous fire hazard, uh, this particular property, because it's not only the front yard, but it's adjacent to the flood control driveway and the backyard, and it backs on a ranch. And I think, as far as I know, the owner is an employee of the County of Santa Barbara, not uh, present at the property. That's Paul, let me ask you, was the backyard done a while back? No. Okay. I complained, a letter went out last September about the property, a double letter. In fact, the letter was erroneously sent to my house. <laughs> Because well, we wanted the, you to clean it well, up. Well, no, the, the problem is the property is so bad you can't really read the address. It looks like a different number than the actual address. So I had my curb repainted so there was no question of my address. But, no, nothing has ever been done on the backyard. It is a tremendous fire hazard because we had a fire a couple of years ago which could have very well uh, caught the whole neighborhood on fire, and that's a, a big concern. Thank you, Paul. Um, Chief, just so you know, um, Paul and I spoke about this, and I went out and looked at it, and just trying to be nice, I made phone calls and had a conversation with the property owner, and I'm going to say it was three months ago, and they assured me that they would take care of the backyard, okay. and so the ball's in your court. Uh, we'll take uh, a look at it. You need to go drive by there and look. It's probably eight feet in the backyard okay. from the building clear up into the hillside. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this issue? Okay, seeing no one rise, we'll come back to council. Council Member Costa, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do actually have an additional question um, that I didn't ask the first time around, and that was uh, I see on some of the properties, such as the Level 3 Communications on East Laurel Avenue, there's a parens RR. I was wondering what that stands for since there's no number to address. It's railroad property, um, so there's different. Um, most of the, like the level three communications in Union Pacific, um, and what was the exact one you were talking about? I just said RR. Right. Yeah. Any of them? Any of them? Right. I think that means it's for railroad. Yeah, that answers my question. That's not a problem. And then um, my last question would be: the only folks that would be receiving um, a fine for this abatement are those that are on this current list here. Correct, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I accept a motion. Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will make the motion to uh, hold a public hearing to receive the comments and to adopt the resolution 571C16 ordering the fire chief to abate said nuisances as declared on April 19, 2011, by Resolution 5712, in the time provided by law. And a second. Seconded. Okay, is there any other discussion on this? Seeing none, could we please vote? And that passes 5-0. Okay, 
The next one is item number nine, adopting the amendment to add the Santa Maria Integrated Waste Management Facility to the countywide siting element for Santa Barbara County and our solid waste superintendent. We had a great time at that meeting, didn't we? <laughs> um, Claudia Stein, it was, that's my name was left off there. Um, honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, the Lo City of Lompoc participates in the Multi-Jurisdictional Solid Waste Task Group. This group consists of mayors and council members from um, jurisdictions within the county, as well as members of the Board of Supervisors. One of the main purposes of the task group is to discuss long-range solid waste management planning. A technical advisory group of the multi-jurisdictional group recommended that a new landfill be sited in northern Santa Barbara County prior to the closure of the Santa Maria Regional Landfill. The City of Santa Maria took on that task and has chosen a preferred site. This, um, in order to move forward with the project, however, they must be, um, the proposed site must be added to the countywide siting element. Tonight you will hear a presentation from Steve Kahn, um, utility engineer for the City of Santa Maria. After his presentation, Mr. Kahn, Larry Bean, the Public Works Director, and I are available to answer any questions you might have. You'll then be um, voting on Resolution 5711, approving the countywide siting element addendum, which amends the siting element to incorporate the City of Santa Maria proposed integrated waste management facility. At that time, I would, at this time, I would like to um, introduce Steve Kahn from the City of Santa Maria Utility Department. Welcome, Steve. And let me just say for the benefit of everyone that prior to this coming to us, there's a countywide, you want to repeat the name? Multi-Jurisdictional Solid Waste Task Group. <laughs> now you see why I wouldn't repeat it. And one, uh, one person from each city serves on that and we heard this previously and it had to pass muster there before it came here so thank, thank you, you very much go ahead thank you honorable mayor and council members again my name is steve Kahn from the city of santa maria i'm going to give you a brief background of this project and uh what we're proposing um here i gotta do this there we go currently the city of santa maria deposits solid waste at their site on east main street and this is a picture of it out by the uh, santa maria river uh, the existing facility is approximately 291 acres. The bottom is lined, is leachate collection system. Uh, it also has uh, recycling facilities, concrete and asphalt. And we just recently opened a recycle center for the public that's been extremely successful in encouraging um, recycling. Also, what's something we're very proud of is we actually take the methane gas that's produced from this landfill and we pipe it down Main Street and it's sent to Marion Hospital. Marion Hospital uses that gas to produce electricity at a reduced rate below the cost of PG&E. So Marion Hospital saves a little money and the city of Santa Maria makes a little money on the gas so everybody wins on that one. Um, as has been repeated a couple times, the multi jurisdictional Solid Waste Task Group was created in 2001. Uh, the, the cities and the county of Santa Barbara got together and said, we have to plan solid waste for the future of Santa Barbara County in order to make sure we can provide it for the citizens. Also, state law requires that you have 15 years of solid waste planning. So this group de uh, developed some guiding principles in order to start that. They wanted to have local control. They wanted to make sure that they weren't uh, held hostage by another agency or, or private firm. They wanted regional service for the entire area. They wanted waste diversion or recycling. They wanted economic efficiencies to make sure they could do it cost effectively. A reliability so they could depend on a new site and flexibility so they could grow as the technology grows. So they developed a technical advisory committee in order to study a biosolids, commercial recycling, green waste, alternative to disposal, uh, C&D recycling, and disposal options. Uh, during the time they came up uh, during their disposal option report, they decided that the city of Santa Maria should site a solid waste facility or a landfill in northern Santa Barbara County. So Santa Maria took charge of that pursuit. Santa Maria uh, developed some site selection criteria in order to look for that site. They wanted to make sure the landfill could be designed correctly on the site. They wanted to make sure that the visual impacts were mitigated. Landfills are not always the best things to look at. Uh, they wanted to make sure that cultural resources were not affected, that you had easy access to it. Infrastructure wasn't too expensive. 
that the land use compatibility around it was good so that there weren't too many people disturbed, and that the geology, topography, and hydrology was correct, and that there weren't too many biological resources impacted by the development of the new landfill. So the city of Santa Maria did a siting study to look for options. They selected four sites to uh, look at that. And the site they selected was the, what we call Los Flores Ranch. This is a picture of it. It's along US 101 on the east side of US 101 as you're traveling south on 101 and you're leaving Santa Maria and you go by Orchid. It would be just up Solomon Grade to your left. Um, it's right after the wine grapes. It's a gorgeous piece of property. And here shows a site map of the location. Historically, the site's been used for cattle grazing and oil extraction. There still is some oil extraction on the site. And here's just a couple uh, views of it. So what we did is we did a conceptual design of the facility, and we've designed a facility that will last at least 90-year capacity with a 286-acre footprint. Uh, commercial solid waste vehicles would be the only vehicles that would go to the site. That's an important distinction. All the residential people coming from their homes, working on the weekends, or other haulers would still bring it to the existing uh, city of Santa Maria landfill, and then we would transfer it to this facility. So there's not going to be a lot of vehicles going to the site. And green waste and recycling would also be handled at the existing landfill. Here's the footprint of the uh, integrated waste management facility after about 25 years. You can see we're not using all of the property. And the yellow part, it details the access road, uh, scale house locations, solid waste, and other areas. So in the design, we uh, wanted to put a liner below it to make sure that groundwater is protected. We uh, designed it to a maximum credible earthquake. And we had an integrated uh, drainage and control to make sure we didn't have any polluted waters come off the site. And we also have a landfill gas control system with potential future gas to energy facilities similar to what we did with Marion Hospital. And here is a contour of the ground I want to show you to show you how deep the groundwater is. It's approximately five to 700 feet deep. Below the surface, we have existing exploratory wells that we're monitoring the groundwater and we'll continue to monitor the groundwater so there's lots of buffer between the solid waste and groundwater. Right now, the facility is used for Los Flores Ranch Park Passive Recreation. You can hike it, you can photograph, horseback ride, bicycle ride, and people are doing that right now as we speak. Well, they're doing it during the day, they're not doing it right now. And they'll be doing it into the future. We plan to run both facilities um, simultaneously in the future. So we entered the environmental review process uh, to get the integrated waste management facility uh, approved. We closely studied all the uh, subjects we show on the screen there. And in April 20th, 2010, the EIR was approved. So now, as was stated earlier, we have to update the countywide siting element. Again, what the countywide siting element is, it talks the state required document that talks about all the solid waste facilities inside the county. It does require that you have a 15 year capacity. That's why one of the reasons why we're moving forward on this. All the cities in the county of um, Santa Barbara have to vote on it. And today, I'd like, I'm happy to report that the city of Santa Barbara approved it, the city of Goleta approved it, the city of Santa Maria approved it, and we're going to move forward and on June the 7th we'll be going back to the county of Santa Barbara for final approval. Um, the LTF is a state required technical committee, local task force, LTF, that's required to review these documents and they did so. And in it, they had three recommendations. They recommended that the city should implement curbside green waste collection program. And we are implementing that. And we've already got it approved by the city council. We did a Prop 218 vote. So we'll be implementing it for the city of Santa Maria. And in July of this year, it will be starting. Uh, they also recommended that we implement a business generated hazardous waste program. Right now, the city of Santa Maria has a household hazardous waste program, but we don't have a business program. So we agreed to that, which can allow for businesses to produce uh, larger hazardous waste to drop it off and then we deal with it. And that program will be opened in the winter of 2012. And the third request of the LTF was that the city of Santa Maria should 
monitor uh, developing conversion technology, recycling and composting program. As you probably know, the County of Santa Barbara is looking at doing conversion technology at the Tahegas landfill down on the coast there, and so we've been monitoring that program. We are always looking at new programs to make sure that we're being most cost effective and environmentally friendly and improving our recycling, and we'll continue to do that so we're complying with the LTF recommendations here, and our permits will be checked every five years to be sure that we're looking at the latest technology uh, to be sure we're doing it environmentally friendly. So as I said, each city is considering this approval and voting on it, and the County of Board of Supervisors will vote on it. Uh, the next step in the environmental process is we're going out for bid to an open space management plan for the entire site. We have an environmental consi a consultant produce a document that will talk about where the trails go, where we have wetlands reproduced, where we're going to plant oak trees that will be mitigated that are removed from the site and how we handle the aesthetics. It'll be a complete environmental document for the management of the entire site, so we'll be working on that. We're also going to be submitting to the Army Corps of Engineers, Department of Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife, and other regulatory agencies for massive amounts of permits we'll need to open this facility. And uh, after the siting element is approved, if it's approved, we'll be submitting to Cal Recycle, which is a state agency that's in charge of landfills for our approval. We'll also be submitting to County of Santa Barbara, local enforcement agency, Regional Water Quality Board, and Santa Barbara Air Pollution Control District. And this facility we hope to have open by the year 2015, so we've got a few years to work on it. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to tell you, uh, without saying I'm going to approve it yet, but I, I think it's a fantastic project. I mean, you're taking some beautiful property. You showed us some pictures there. I hadn't seen the pictures before. And doing it in phases so that the public still has access to the trails, um, horseback riding. I think it's a fantastic idea, and I'm really glad you're doing it that way. It looks like it's going to really work, so thank you. Councilmember Starbuck. What's conversion technology? Conversion technology. Um, this is a process that's being done a lot in Europe and in Japan because there's very little space for landfill. And what you do is you take the solid waste, and there's many methods you can do it, but you incinerate it and you produce um, usually energy off of it. It makes it disappear. There is some residual waste. There are some air impacts to it, and it is a little more uh, cost cost more to do it. But there's several different methods for conversion technologies. There's incineration, there's um, where you kind of cook it, there's all sorts of modern methods. And so the County of Santa Barbara will be looking at conversion technology. They're going out and selecting a consultant right now to do it and to run pilot programs for them at Tahegas. So over the next three to five years, you'll be hearing a lot about it from the County of Santa Barbara. And we're going to continue to monitor it. And if it's cost effective and environmentally superior, this site, we can actually put conversion technology at this site if it's successful. Councilmember Costa. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad that was brought up because that was what I got excited about as well. I was really glad that this was looking out 90 years, which is very promising. It's not short-term. This is a very long-term solution. And also conversion, of course, being on the forefront, which is exciting for me. So thank you for including that. I do have a question for Ms. Stein, actually. I don't want to digress too far, but I'm just curious. Um, I know that the life of our landfill, of course, is not infinite. And at um, some point, would there be any relationship with this new landfill for the city of Lompoc? More than likely, we'll all end up at this regional landfill. <laughs> um, right now, our landfill has until 2045. And so in 2030, um, we'll need to start looking at our 15-year um, outlook. But um, Tegas is almost full. Um, we have the longest life of a landfill until this one opens at 2045 that handles our waste shed, which is the city of Lompoc, Vandenberg Village, Mission Hills, Mesa Oaks, those, and, and in our local valley. Um, and then there's Boxen is a little tiny one that they're clo they've closed. The city of Santa Maria's is almost full. So um, next to this one, we have the longest life left. And you believe that this is a good solution at that point? Yes. To utilize this. Yes, it's, it's 
to correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but this will be the first new landfill in the state of California since AB 939 was passed. It's very difficult to site a brand new landfill. There have been expansions, but no new landfills because of all the costs and the environmental documents. And Okay, so then I do have one additional question. We're looking at 90 years, but that was under the assumption that only the city of Santa Maria would be utilizing that property, or is that assuming that it would eventually have a That 90 property? years, what we did with that, it assumes the Santa Maria Waste Shed, which is the city of Santa Maria, city of Orchid, and the surrounding county areas. It also assumed taking the waste from Tahegas, because at the time when we started this process, we didn't know that the county was going to go with conversion technology. So it looked at taking the waste from not only Santa Maria, but from the waste from Santa Barbara, um, Goleta, um, Buellton, Solvang, that entire area. So if conversion technology is successful and Tahegas does conversion technology, it only sends the residual waste to Santa Maria, it could last much more than 90 years. Great. This capacity, is why I love living in Capacity is usually based on how much is going in. And so the less you put in the landfill, the longer the life. So, right. you know, our life has grown. And um, so, it, you know, the more you recycle, obviously, the longer the life. So the year is just an estimate. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's interesting to note that I recall being in Chehalis, Washington in 1972 when they came into the Goodyear store I happened to be at and they were teaching the store employees about what they needed to change in their, in their operation because they were going to catalytic incineration and you couldn't put oil filters in there anymore because they go bang, it's really bad. <laughs> Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to the city. Oh, public hearings. Okay, now we're going to open this up for public comment. Would anybody like to talk about this? Thank you. No? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to the council. And I want to say that, that your program was the most exciting one at that meeting by far. Matter of fact, I'm told it was the most exciting thing in a number of years at that meeting. Um, and now, Councilmember Starbuck. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and make the motion that the city adopt resolution 5711, parentheses 11, approving the countywide siting element addendum. And a second. I'll second that. Um, how much did the mayor offer us for this? <laughs> Just kidding, folks. Their mayor is always giving us a, a once over at meetings. It, is there any other discussion on this item from the council? Okay, seeing none, could we vote, please? And that passes 5 0. Um, with regard to item 10, the Lompoc Transit Short Range Transit Plan, it's come to my attention that Councilmember Lingle did not receive a copy of this and had not been able to prepare. And I personally have a number of issues with this that I wasn't able to resolve prior to the meeting. Um, my preference would be to continue this item unless there's an objection from the Council. <laughs> Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, seeing as that is a long document, I also feel like I have not had adequate time to review the entire document itself, and I would appreciate the extension on that. Okay. Um, City Administrator, was there any issue with that? You were in check on that for us. Mayor and Council, we do have the uh, consultant here in the audience. If you would uh, want to have him go ahead and give the presentation tonight, it's a, something for your consideration. Um, from my standpoint, I'd rather get it in one lick. And when, when we re redo it, would yeah, whoever you are out there, raise your hand. Can you join us in at our next meeting? Okay, sorry about that. Um, Councilmember Martin, um, can we specify a date when uh, this is going to come up again? June 7th. And then I need a motion from someone to continue this item to the meeting of June 7th. <coughs> Councilmember Costa. So moved. And 
a second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to continue this item to June 7th. It, oh, sorry, Councilman Martiner. Um, I would like to make uh, the comment that it would be added on to the agenda item on June 7, but it would not replace any of the agenda items that are already placed on the agenda. It would be an additional, correct? That's correct. Thank you. And it would move to the head of the bus. Okay, and is there any other discussion? Seeing none, could we vote, please? And that passes 5-0, and now we'll take... We're doing really well. We'll have a 10-minute break. Okay, and now we have item number 11, award of... RFP 11-TI-01 for Transit System Operations and Services and our Aviation Transportation Manager, Richard Fernbaugh. Richard. Mr. Mayor, members of Council, it's recommended that you award the contract for RFP 11-T101 to store transit systems for approximately $4,675,540 over the period of the next five years and authorize the mayor to execute the contract. The contract with our current transit provider, American Stars, expires on June 30th of this year, and in March of this year, the city released a, a request for proposals to select a contractor for the next contract period. A joint RFP was developed uh, for both the city of Lompoc and San Inez Valley Transit is something that we've done before and uh, the reason we did that was that staff on both sides felt that we would get more bids and better quality bids and also um, probably a better price if we offered two properties rather than just one singly. Uh, seven proposals were received and opened on April 18th. Proposers were American Star of Pismo Beach MV Transportation of Fairfield, Paratransit Services of Bremerton, Washington, Silver Auto Stages of San Luis Obispo, Store Transit Systems Modesto, First Transit C Cincinnati, Ohio, and Roadrunner Shuttle and Limousine Service of Camarillo. Um, just as a side note, normally the last two times we've put out RFPs, we've gotten two to three proposals, so seven was quite an increase. The evaluation panel then rated the proposals based on factors which were listed in the RFP, including experience in dial ride and fixed out route operations, financial capabilities, references, organizational depth, insurance coverage, proposal approach and completeness, and cost of providing the service as described in the scope of services. All factors were weighed and the sums awarded by each evaluator were added for a total score. The panel found all four shortlisted proposals to be responsible qualified transportation management companies. However, when the points were tallied, store transportation systems received the highest rating by the panel. The pa de panel excuse me, determined that they offered the best combination of abilities and price. The store transit system proposal totals approximately $4.6 million over five years with an initial price of $33.53 per hour. This is a significant savings over the current contract price of $36.84 per hour and will save the city approximately $89,000 in the first year based on 26,797 hours that were listed in the RFP. Two new technological enhancements will be implemented during this contract period at no cost to the City of Lompoc. First is an iDrive system, which is a vehicle monitoring system which captures high definition videos of both the front and rear of the vehicle using a dual camera device and records when an event occurs. Examples of events that would trigger recording include accidents, aggressive driving, door open events, or panic. Um, also, it includes a panic button that the driver can hit if something happens on the bus that needs to be recorded. Secondly, a, a system called Stratagen. This is a computerized reservation system for our ADA service. The system will allow us to schedule reservations up to 14 days in advance 
and more efficiently route buses by allowing the batching of riders, which puts more riders on buses for each revenue hour. This will allow us to get the most out of each revenue hour service, thereby improving our fare box recovery ratio. Staff recommends that store transit systems be awarded the transit operations contract in accordance with City Procurement Code Section 2604F. The contract will be funded from account number 23000-53449. This contract is a term for five years with two optional one-year periods, the RFP and the contract contain language that if mutually agreeable to both parties, the contract may be extended up for, to up for two additional years, and that the cost for revenue hour will be increased by the consumer price index or 1.5%, whichever is less. There was a uh, protest filed by American Star Transportation um, was a request for waiver of protest process rules under the RFP 11 T101 section 7. Um, that request for waiver was denied based on the timeliness of the um, request. Uh, request had to be um, for protest had to be request received three days after the opening of the bids. We did not receive it until 25 days later on May 12th. Available for questions. At the opening of the bids, would... At the bid opening, would one competitor have known what another one had bid? No. I was the only one that opened the bids. Uh, the actual... They, they, they were requests for proposals and not a... It wasn't like a regular bid opening. Um, we reviewed the proposal before we actually reviewed the prices that were given um, because we didn't want to base it just simply on price. Uh, we had a number of other uh, items that were set um, that were given percentages that we wanted to score first. Then after the panel did that, then we opened the price proposals. I guess my question is for the city attorney then. How do you protest something you don't know about? I guess you ask questions. You know what the date is of the timing of the opening. And so you know you have three days after that to be able to file a protest. So you take the responsibility to do what you need to do during those three days to get the information you feel you need and then protest. Would those documents be available and be public record at the time they were opened if you requested them? Yes, because the documents that you're talking about aren't what's needed for the protest at that stage. At that stage, all you're protesting, or the, only, the, the way the system is set up or the program is set up, what you're protesting is the um, bid specifications itself not the result. Correct. Okay. That's the second level of protest. If someone wanted to do that, they would protest after the award of the contract. So that protest would take place after today if we awarded the contract Correct. today or a future date on, if it was awarded on a future date. Okay. Correct. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Frunbaugh, is someone from Store Transit here this evening? Yes, Steve Fernandez. Okay, so Impact. we'll be able to ask some questions of him then. But I do have one question for you. In your report, you indicate that we should expect to see approximately an $89,000 savings in year one based on the 26,000 revenue hours. Should we expect right. to see s similar savings in years two through five? Yes, the, the actual costs are listed on the back page of this. Um, we're currently paying uh, 3684 per hour. Um, as you see at the end of five years, we're still not up to what we're currently paying. So there is significant savings over what we're currently paying in all five years. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, I've got a couple questions. Um, 
would we typically go to a five-year um, contract rather than, I don't know, three, two, one, whatever? Um, in the past, we've done uh, a three-year with a two-year extension. Uh, the FTA now allows you to go to a five-year with a two-year extension. Um, so we went to the maximum. Um, we also thought we'd get the better price with a longer contract. And, um, and of course, we have termination abilities anywhere in the contract period. Okay, and this was, this RFP went out prior to the receipt of the, I'm gonna use the right word, the um, short range transit plan. So what they were bidding on was not necessarily what was recommended in the, tra in the short range transit plan, correct? There was no draft well, copy out ahead of it? Yeah, what, what we actually did was we anticipated that if council approved the elimination of the last hour of service and the elimination of the 2A route, which is our lowest performing route, uh, we took those hours out of our normally service hours, and those are the hours that we utilized in the RFP. And then we have beyond that, we have the capability during the contract to adjust those hours 20% each way, either way. Okay. Do you feel 20% is a wide enough margin for anything you need to do in the future? At this point, yes. Okay. And if that didn't turn out to be the case, what would the remedy be? Uh, we would renegotiate the price per revenue hour. Because you have a certain amount of fixed overhead you have to pass across all the revenue hours, basically. Okay. Um, I noticed in reading some of these things that dial -a ride is separated with a different contractor in some areas. Is that something we've tried to do in the past? We have not tried to do that in the past. Um, I don't know that it be beneficial to us cost-wise to have two operators operating in a city our size. Um, don't think it would probably be very feasible. And just for council's edification, when I asked Richard these questions, I have a lot of confidence because I learned the other day that we won a rather large award in 2006, or rather Richard's leadership won it for us. Why don't you share that? Well, it was a, an award by the California Transit Association uh, for um, actually increase in service more or less and um, extensive rider increases. Um, when I came on board in 1998, we had about 100,000 riders a year, and at the time of this award, we had over 300,000. Um, so it was like an efficiency award. Um, and, and how did you rate compared to other systems in the state, Richard? Very high. Yeah. Number one, I think. He's very modest. Um, uh, would, um, was the iDrive something that we, we're going to pay for and install, or this is something they're going to pay for and install? Well, this is a system that store uh, installs on our, all their buses, I believe. Yes. And, and they're going to pay for the system? Correct. And with regard to the Stratagen, is that our our equipment or their equipment? That um, is proposed to be purchased by the city of Solvang and shared by the cities, uh, so it would not go away once, you know, if we change contractors at any point, it would remain with us. Kind of an uh, internet-based system? Uh, yes. And was that, um, was the knowledge that that system was going to come into play in the RFP, or is that a kind of an add-on after? Uh, we talked about it. Uh, we actually talked to each proposer about 
um, improvements that could be made to the dial ride system specifically. And there are a couple of different programs that can be utilized. Um, there's ride, can't think of them right now, but yeah. there are like three different programs, four different programs. And so we had two of them that were proposed by one by store and one by paratransit. And uh, store has used this system for a number of years. They're up to date on it. And I believe they were one of the first or the first, yeah, to actually use the system. So it'll be easy for them to bring up anyone up to speed on. Okay. Um, who's next? Councilmember Costa. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, back to the stratagen, um, there is going to be an initial cost with this, correct? Not to us. No, it wasn't that $30,000? Right. Uh, paid for by the city of Salt Lake. Okay, so there is no initial cost right. to that. And then I believe, Marilyn, you may have st stated this question I may not have fully understood. Um, I know you talked about hours in regards to... Um, the short range transit plan, but were there any other uh, recommendations um, or level of service issues uh, in there um, that would affect what we requested in the bid or what's in the contract currently? No, we just, we anticipated that there would be more changes because of the concern about our fare box recovery ratio. And so in talking to people, in the interviews, uh, we were very interested on, uh, in anything they would come up with or offer that would, you know, be more efficient for our operation. Um, and the short range transfer plan, as you'll hear at your next meeting and, and read in your presentations, um, stresses efficiency and effectiveness prior to going to any fare box increases or fare increases. Um, so we want to hit all those first. So that's where we questioned the, the proposers uh, was, what can you bring to the table that will make us more efficient and effective and get our fare box up without just going to a fare box increase? And do you feel that our contract allows for enough flexibility in the case that we come up with those solutions to implement them during the contract? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Councilmember. Councilmember Starbuck. Uh, okay, a couple of things I have questions on. Uh, first, I'd like to go ahead and make a disclosure that my brother-in-law is a driver for the Colt system, and he did ask me about this and said, no, talk to me, <laughs> you know. Um, second thing I'm going to go on about, I on the public notice, there was five items listed, and we've listed seven in our service implementation schedule here. The last two are maximum... It says reduce the number of demand response vehicles and maximum service to one. And then the other item that wasn't included on the public notice was provide more shared trips on the demand response service through improved dispatching. Now, is dispatching handled through the contractor or is that done through us? The contractor does that. So the contractor picks that up too. Um, I always am curious when there's a significant difference in, in bids, through, especially through as many people that have bid this. and. Richard, what are the chances of some type of change order on this changing later on? Mm, not in the last two that we've done. Never done. So yeah. that's, that's why we asked for a big price up front. The only two would be, you know, in the last two years where there's either CPI or 1.5%, whichever is lower. Yeah. Um, is there a reason that we didn't include the the number, reduce the number of demand response vehicles in our public notice in the paper? I'm sorry. This was the Oh, little, the reduction of the number? The, well, yeah, here in, the, in our well, that would, proposed plan, we, we've listed seven, but only showed five. Uh, those would be operational changes that we'd make as we find an efficiency in them. So, so these were taken into account by all the contracts, people that submitted bids then? Yeah. Councilmember Costa? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I too want to make a disclosure that I met uh, with Mr. and Mrs. Doherty, uh, who are representatives of American Star Transportation here at City Hall. Um, it was information only, and I was there just to listen. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Thank you, Richard. And then I'd like to invite uh, the the uh, representative for Store Transportation Systems, if you have a comment you'd like to make and you'll be next and if you would state your name and title for the record good evening mayor Lynn and council members my name is Stephen Fernandez vice president store transit systems Modesto California uh, First of all, let me thank you for uh, inviting us to the RFP process. Uh, it was uh, obviously a successful RFP, RFP process in our opinion. It seemed extremely fair to us um, all the way through. Uh, our company has been in business since 1952, originated in the Stanislaus County area as a school bus contractor. In 1982, we opened our transit operations and made up operating transit services since that time. Uh, we've expanded throughout Stanislaus County and our surrounding counties in the Central Valley. We remain here in California and consider ourselves to be a local contractor. We currently provide pretty close to 600,000 vehicle service hours every year, transport pretty close to 600,000 passengers every year as well. Um, I'm open for any questions that you might have. Councilmember Member Lingle. Um, yeah, I may have more later, but just a quick question, the current Drivers, employees. Yes. What hap are, are they? Do you take them on? What happens with them? Yes, we take them on. We agreed as part of the RFP process that those employees would come over and become employees of ours. And might I say, our RFP included a um, raise for all of those employees. We consider those employees to be uh, slightly underpaid at this time in our evaluation of your system. And so uh, our proposal did include a raise in a rate increase for each of, for those drivers okay. and dispatchers as well. Okay. And. The reason I'm going to ask these questions, we've all received a letter from a citizen um, kind of complaining about the current drivers, the unprofessionalism, um, drivers using their MPV players, uh, playing loud music. What type of training, retraining, if Necessary, would you be using? Would you uh, be all of the drivers of the current system will go through our retraining process. One of the reasons that we have a slightly higher pay scale is we believe we have a higher expectation for our drivers. When we come in, we're going to train them um, and they're going to go through policy and pro procedure training with us and they're going to understand that higher expectation and that customer service orientation that our company has. We have never lost a contract. Um, once, since 1952 and our company's inception, once we took over a contract, that contract has never left us. We continue today to operate every one of those contracts because we have a higher level of service and we have higher expectations for our employees. We pay them higher and so we have higher expectations for them as well. So we will bring that same level of service and that same expectation for our employees to this system. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Marino. I know in awarding this contract, um, I'm not looking at um, the specifics of the pay and, and that and things. But since you brought it up, I am simply just curious um, about the benefits for the employees. I know that I've had one of the individuals approach me and a little worried about that, and so I wanted to um, just find out the information to then give on to them. Our benefits will match or exceed those that were included in the RFP by the current contractor. In most cases, they'll exceed. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, no, not at this time. Okay, stand by for questions. Mr. Mayor and Council, um, Public Works Director Larry Bean would like to address you. Absolutely, come on down, Larry. Well, it's a very short I'll just stay okay. here. I'd like to clarify the question that council member uh, Starbuck raised about the ads on the buses in the newspaper. Those ads were not for this item. They were th for the previous item, the short range transit plan. So if there were, if you think there was a discrepancy between the two, we'll reread re them. 
and put them out. They'll be back on the buses and back in the newspaper again since we're having the short tra range transit plan hearing on June 7th. Okay. So they weren't for this item. Okay, now I'd like to invite our current vendor for the bus service to address the council. Um, should um, discuss the fact that he and I spoke earlier and I told him I wouldn't be able to meet with him and invited him to bring his concerns and comments here and share them with the public and the council. Good evening. My name is Bob Doherty. I'm one of the owners of American Star Transportation. My wife is the president, Trudy. We have our projects manager and our district manager with us. Stand up, Randy, so they know you. He's running the operation here in Lompoc. And his boss is John. Stand up, John. Stand up, John, so they see you. <laughs> John Dotson. So we have our first-line supervisors here tonight to answer any of your questions, and I can't. It was 10 years ago when we started the contract, first with the cult system. At that time, the cult system was in poor disarray. They had four prior contractors that stayed for a very short time. People complaining, routes missed, runs not made. It was a shambles. It was an absolute mess. We were hired, and we stepped in the door, and from the time we stepped in the door, we went uphill with it and took it out of the doldrums. We offered the employees more money, more benefits, and they voted the union out. Pretty unheard of, isn't it? The union was out. Uh, we worked as a team with Larry Bean and Richard Fernbaugh. Great team. Together, we built the transit system into a show place for the state, for the whole entire state. You heard about the award, Richard mentioned there early in 2006. That is a team effort. It's just not Richard, and it's just not Larry, it's also American Star that put it all together. And we were humming along for a period after that, and then the equation changed. Larry Bean needed a helper, so they hired Kevin McCure, McClune. And he transferred his duties as transit director to Kevin. Kevin was hired, there wasn't enough money in the budget to hire him directly as a public um, as his successor. They needed more money, so they dipped into the transit fund. A lot of dipping, but dipped in the transit fund and had enough money to offer a position, a position to get a qualified person. The person they hired had very little transit experience and hardly any at all of ADA experience or data ride. So the system at that point was, again, it was transferred to Kevin. Kevin had a different management style, and that and the decay started then of the system. There was no cooperation. They weren't asked to, to have any put at all in the system. It was all Kevin telling Richard what to do with us. Kevin's position was stronger. Richard's was less strong. And the biggest thing that's been hindrance to the system is a failure to have a short-range transit plan for almost four years. This is the transit bible. This is the road map that gives us the direction to take the system. Richard kept asking for it. He didn't receive it. We didn't have one to work with. We couldn't work with Richard. We didn't have a plan. So we're floating along. We still don't have a short-range transit plan. This is a mandatory requirement with the FTA. You can't even take the FTA funds without having one. So when the city of Lompoc goes up and asks for the transit funds, they're supposed to have a mandatory. It's the government's way of knowing that the taxpayers' money will be utilized in a prudent manner. It's our roadmap. We haven't had that. Now let's talk about what Richard just presented, Richard Fernbaugh. Interesting, I thought. First of all, cost was a major factor, right? Now, there were other bidders. There was a very low bidder 
that was also a competent firm. And I'm going to ask Richard what that price was. What was the price of the low bid on an hourly rate? You don't recall? You don't? You don't recall, M Mr. Well, Mayor? Could you have the person address the council? You're going to oh, need I'm sorry. To I'm sorry. Could you ask Richard uh, what the low price was? There are four bidders. Uh, let me ask them that question. When we get done. I'm taking notes as we go. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure it was in the 24, 23 to 25. It was somewhere very low. Now, this was a competent bidder. A competent bidder. You know, our work is done. We can go home right now. If you're going for a low bid. That's approximately $1.4 million cheaper than store is doing it for over the life of the contract of seven years. I need that exact figure to give you an exact, but it's, it's in that range. We need to quit now. I mean, why wouldn't anybody in their right mind save a million point four? So there's other factors that have gone into this besides the low price. Even though you were told the low price was the most important thing, we're somewhere around $2.40 more than store. And that's to provide uh, our employees pay is important, but benefits are more important. So they requested a number of things that we're going to provide them. But it, that's one of the differences in the price. Okay. So the price isn't that much. So now Richard presents you with a report, a staff report, that if you read it real close, and I, I, I was dumbfounded to hear what he said. I just about fell on the floor. Now if I can find it. Is it there? He, they, they refer to the low price, okay. It wasn't that far out of whack. We aren't out that far out of whack. And he refers in here that two new technical enhancements will be implemented during the contract period at no cost to the city of Lompoc. He gives us the, me the impression, may not you, me, that the iDrive will be provided by the carrier and the software will be provided by the carrier. If you look at it, at no cost to the city of Lompoc. This was never brought up that they're going to provide a $44,000 software package. And we got the impression that Store was in providing that package at no cost to the city. I, I was just dumbfounded. So they used that, twisted the, the facts, and used that as a way, excuse me, of showing this store was superior. Now the iDrive system. The iDrive system, in, in fact, Richard has federal funds to install security camera systems on the buses. Since Richard has had that money, the systems have changed a great deal. They're not simple to say anymore. They're very complex and more reasonable. So they can give you real-time onboard surveillance of the passengers. They can now give you driver event recordings. They can give you the probably the best marketing tool you're going to see. We have a number of passengers. Many of them are in the school age, the college age. Would you get me a drink, please, Julie? The school age and the college, college age and working age. These devices now come with a Wi-Fi system, so everybody on that bus can utilize their cameras, I mean, their computers, iPod systems, electronic devices, while the bus is going down the road. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I had open heart surgery, six bypasses 33 days ago, so it's been a while getting over it. But anyhow, I'm here. So you had a good system that you can buy with federal funds and not have the transit company put it in there and use that as a cost benefit when you have the money available now. Now, no one's asked Anthony. Now, Anthony Garcia, your fleet maintenance supervisor, is probably the biggest pain. He is probably the biggest perfectionist. And by far in the 50 years I've been in this business, and I've been around a lot, and I'm older than a lot. Not so much. There's a lot of older ones in here, too. Thank you. I've been around this for 50 years, and he's probably the best maintenance fleet supervisor I have ever known. He takes pride in his fleet. It isn't our buses. It isn't your buses. It isn't the city of Lompoc's buses. They're Anthony's buses. 
It's like if you're, we borrow Anthony's bus. It's just like you went to prom and you wanted dad's car. He's going to check that car before you took it out and bring it back. And you better not put a ding on his bus. Now, Anthony has always forbidden the carrier to install any device of any kind. You can't touch that bus. You can't put it any kind of electronic device. You can't modify it. Because when you do that, who has the liability? The city of Lompoc if the bus burns down? Somebody gets hurt as a result of the device? Or is it the carrier? Also, Anthony, and I know, he would ask you, if the city has the money, why don't you have your own devices? So you don't, he has control of it, he'll maintain it, and if a catastrophic event happens, it belongs to the city of Lompoc. Now the carrier, the store is saying that they need this camera to, to uh, use it to supervise their drivers by. That's in the, the uh, statement. In other words, they're going to, any events, they'll retrain their drivers. Anthony would ask you, why, what kind of training do they get received before they get in my bus? Are they going to use a, a device to tell them to retrain the driver, or are they going to train the driver first? So Anthony wouldn't, I don't think that Anthony, and he's a tough guy, I don't know if you can get him to put these in those buses. Not your buses, his buses. <laughs> and this liability, if you have an accident, and they own the device and the recording, and they have an event that costs more than their maximum insurance, they're going to use that device, the insurance company, is to come after you to get you paid above that. So store's personal income is not affected. And they're going to have that device and that recording in their possession. If the city of Lompoc owned it, the city of Lompoc would have possession of it. And your attorney can decide whether they wanted to use it or not. The other thing that comes to mind, um, I'm sorry. Uh, any questions up so far? So far, you want to cover a few? I've got more stuff to go, but do you want? Got about four minutes left on the fifteen we agreed to. Okay. Yeah, I'm just. I'd just like to sum it up by saying we're very close with Stora. You've got a competent company that they accepted and rated as one of the competent companies for a million point four hundred thousand dollars of the life of the contract the city can keep in their coffers. Our, there's a system available in the city that sh and a money available to provide their own recording devices for the drivers, and a software package paid by the city of Solvang. So now that cost is not required for store. The devices aren't necessary with the federal security grants that Richard has that should have been in the buses by now but aren't. I think that kind of sums it up. Is there any questions? None right now, but don't go away. Oh. Go okay. ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> okay, now I'd like to open this for public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this item from the public? Seeing no one rise, we'll close public comment and come back for questions. And Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, I would like to ask our city staff to comment on a couple of things. Um, the first one is um, regarding a short-range transit plan. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the short-range transit plan is recommended by the FTA to be done every five years. It's not a requirement, and I guess the proof is in the pudding. We continue to receive FTA money every year. Okay. Um, it's not a requirement. It's a suggestion. And we've been doing things as we go along. And because of the fare box ratio and the last TDA audit that we had, um, we felt this was a 
a good time to go ahead and do a full short range transit plan again. Um, we've done I've done one since I've been here and uh, we completed it very quickly um, and then we've been addressing uh, unmet needs requirements and uh, other things that we see every day that need to be taken care of uh, that doesn't require a plan uh, to recognize them. So we take that on ourselves and just do those improvements. Thank you. Um, the next comment I, I would like uh, the city staff to address is regarding that the city, uh, or I guess the allegation is that the city has been using transit monies for other management purposes, and I really would like to get a statement from the city staff regarding that concern. Um, okay. There are many errors in what was just spoken. Uh, okay. I, when I was a city engineer, a part of my salary, I believe it's 10 percent, was paid for out of the transit budget because I managed Richard. Uh, when I was given the job as a public works director, Kevin McCune was already on staff, and he uh, was promoted to city engineer. At that time, he was given the job to manage uh, Richard and the transit system, and I believe his salary still to this day is paid about 10% of it from uh, the transit funds because he manages it. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And, uh, Kevin was in charge of the transit system uh, when that award was won. 2006. Thanks. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to address one of the concerns that I believe I have the answer to, and that was the um, I requested to receive the list of bidders as well because I find that very useful when we um, get these contract awards. I know that on the previous one we also received that, so in the future if we can get that I would appreciate that um, from staff. Uh, but I did see that uh, a company by the name of MV, MV, Tra MV Transit uh, was the lowest bidder at approximately $28.67 per revenue hour. However, um, we do have comment that um, proposals by MV Transit as well as two others were found by the review panel to either be incomplete or non-responsive. So they may be the lowest bidder, um, but they were in essence disqualified for certain reasons. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to state was that um, okay. that scoring, um, which actually staff can answer, the scoring rubric that we use, is that uh, available to the public during the bidding process? That uh, price is 15% of the decision? Yes, that's in the RFP. Great. So I just wanted to confirm that um, the price of the bid is only 15% of what is taken into consideration, uh, and the scoring is only approximately 15% of the entire score that you can receive for that. That's one correct. Subject. Thank you. Councilmember Martin. Sorry for asking again. Thank you. Um, I guess my next issue is uh, we did receive, as Councilmember Lingle um, mentioned, we did receive um, a letter of basically complaint for the present system that we have regarding drivers using M3 players and so forth. Um, have, uh, I want to ask the staff, are these complaints uh, uh, normal, usual, do they happen? Is this the first complaint that we have gotten for, for the present system, the present contract that we have had? Uh, we don't get a lot of complaints. Um, those complaints that we do are normally handled uh, very quickly and efficiently by Randy, our project manager. And if there's anything beyond his scope, uh, he will come to me and we'll discuss that and find a resolution to it. Uh, one of the recent things I've heard is uh, the radios in the buses being played. Uh, we actually started about two years ago not ordering radios with buses and uh, as of about a month ago I guess uh, we just said you know we had to turn them off all together because you can never pick the right music for everybody on the bus so we don't do that anymore. 
Thank you, sir. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, Richard, who's paying for the iDrive? Store transportation. Yeah, that's what I thought. And um, do we, in fact, have some federal security funds around currently to provide whatever we choose to provide within the purview of that grant? Yes, we have money available. Uh, we are cur working, currently working with King County, Washington, to piggyback on their RFP or that they did. Um, we have that document, and as soon as they sign it, um, maybe even as soon as the next meeting, we'll bring that to council, and then we will be ordering a camera system. That camera system is substantially different than the iDrive system, and the other systems, such as Santa Maria may have. Um, those ca that camera system specifically is for inside of the bus. It provides us with four interior cameras um, that give us a full view of whatever's going on inside the bus. It also allows us to track each bus by GPS so that we know where that bus is at any one time. It also gives us a track for the whole day on that bus and tells us how fast they were going at different locations so that if we have a complaint of a bus speeding, we can look it up on the computer and verify or, or disverify that. Um, there are a number of options uh, that it has available to us. Um, of course, having the cameras on the buses means that if there's an event on the bus and somebody, you know, we kick somebody off a bus and mom or dad calls us, says my child wouldn't do that, then we can invite them down and show them on the screen the event and they can judge for themselves. So it's a protection system as well. Um, and the camera system that we've been talking to them about has been upgraded and we're getting those upgrades at no increase in price. How long ago did we begin this process? Mm. Roughly. Probably a year ago. We've had a number Part of, of uh, providers come to us and show us different systems. And how long have we had the funds on hand for it? Uh, there are our funds. Um, we plan on using those funds along with the uh, transit security money uh, that you approve for us to go after tonight. Uh, that money is Prop 1B money, and I believe it was proposed that we would normally get that a lot quicker, but because of the economy, the sale of bonds has been stretched out for many years longer than it was anticipated. Uh, so we're building those funds year by year, and we will be able to use those additionally for any security improvements that uh, we may need at a transit center if and when that happens. Okay, do you have a, just a rough idea when, when we started accumulating these? Is that a couple of years or five? Uh, or? Prop 1B was 2006, I believe. So it was starting in, say, 2008, roughly, because it took a while. Okay. Right. And we've been getting it incrementally, correct? Yeah. Anywhere from twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year. What is the approximate cost of the system? About two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for all the buses. And that's installed and with the blessing of our transit fleet manager. Um can I explain the difference in the iDrive from that camera system? Yes, it's clear to um, me, but if you want to summarize it, go ahead. Yeah, The iDrive system is a camera placed on uh, the front windshield inside. It only records events um, 10 seconds prior to an actual event and until the end of that event. Uh, it is not an inside camera system. Uh, it doesn't provide the same type of coverage and um, record keeping that our video system will provide as well as the other um, additional uh, things that that 
video system will provide sources of the GPS and the speed range and that. So the um, <clears throat> the iDrive is basically an, a short event system and has a 10 second buffer at the front end, so it's it's constantly recording and erasing in effect. Correct. And then it goes through the event, and at the end of the trigger period, it stores that bit of information. Right. And the other system is an ongoing camera system that stores information throughout the day with a GPS and a speed tie-in. Correct. And we can also view each bus. If I log into my computer and bring up a specific bus, I can actually watch that bus in real time. So it's basically the same kind of system that they're using over the road trucks. Right. Okay. Doesn't use our Wi-Fi system, does it, by any happy chance? It can be. All right. Life is good. Um, yes. Okay, uh, there was a question about who owns the data in the iDrive. The data in the iDrive would be owned by Store Transportation Service, but we have not yet ever had an event where we did not share that with the municipality. Uh, we insure the vehicles. Um, we insure the drivers, and it is part of our collective insurance that we have these installed on every bus that we operate um, to help us reduce those rates. Uh, store transportation uses both DriveCam and iDrive, and we use them completely throughout our process as part of the hiring process for drivers. Drivers have to watch six events and be able to tell us whether or not they think the drivers in those events were defensive or not defensive drivers. Part of their original training is part of DriveCam and looking at specific events that have occurred over the years for our company and understanding how that happens. It's ongoing training as well. We don't use them to manage and monitor our drivers. We have road supervisors that do that. This is a, an additional supplemental program that we use to assist our drivers in understanding how they can become better drivers, more defensive drivers, um, in addition to the, the normal way that transit operators monitor their drivers with road supervisors, management, and staff. And, and the don't sue me contest. <clears throat> um, Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, this could be, well, Richard, I'll ask you. I just reviewed the agreement again, and even though, as Mr. Doherty mentioned, you know, this is a lower price, we understand that it's, that wasn't the number one issue. But not, the number one issue to me, and I've just reviewed this thing again, I don't see where it's in the agreement at all, is addressing public safety. And you know, we talked a little bit about public safety with the I drive and indicating the, the speed and everything else. The employees that we hire, the drivers, I'm assuming that they are all screened for drug and alcohol prior yes, to correct. driving. Um, is there a periodic screening or is it just a one-time screening? How there's do you address public safety on this? Yes, there's periodic screening. Um, there are unannounced drug tests that happen at random. Okay. Are these uh, DOT? Yeah. Drivers? Yeah. They are? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions from the council? Mr. Bean? Would you be kind enough, maybe come up so we can see your smiling face? The one thing I haven't got my brain wrapped around yet, and I know you'll help me. Um, price is a portion of this, and then there's the larger portion, which involves, um, yeah. T kind of smarten us up a little bit on how you guys look at this. And I, I can share this with you, which we, you gave to us, but, you know, it's a number on a sheet of paper, and I, I guess I need a better sense of it. 
You mean in regard to an RFP process? Um, when you're reviewing these and scoring them, kind of how you you score. Obviously, price is a determiner, but we didn't accept the lowest price, so it's not a sole determiner. And that bidder, as I understand it, was disqualified because their bid was non-responsive and they didn't do what they needed to do from the RFP. Yeah, they didn't fill out the documents correctly. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's obviously one way you get taken out of it. Right. And then the next way is you probably are way, way higher than the group of bidders. And then you're down to the bidders who were reasonable and then you have the other criteria. Well, we didn't throw anybody out because their price was too high. Okay. In fact, American Star was an initial, when they turned in the RFPs, they were the highest. And uh, they came back with a lower price later on in the process. But through the process, the RF, we, felt we put the RFP document together, mail it out, advertise it, and have a closing date, and they turn in their RFP. Our panel reads their documents, looks and see if they've answered all the questions we've asked, provided pricing for all seven years, et cetera, and we make our judgment who wasn't responsive and who was. And then we uh, call, call them back, in this case there was four, and call them back for an interview. And in, during the process of the interview, we look at the price and the other four factors that's listed uh, in the RFP, and I forget exactly what all of them are. I was not on the panel this year. Um, but most of those lead to experience and uh, ideas I might have to run our transit sim system better, et cetera. Experience of the staff that they propose to put in place. Uh, we have to make sure that they propose to rehire the drivers uh, that we have. And uh, we go through that process and score them. Uh, in this one, this, this time, we asked the proposers before they came back for the interview to give us our best, their best and final offer, a chance to sharpen their pencil and come back in uh, with a better price. Did they have knowledge of what all the prices were at that point? Or? Not to my knowledge. We did not pass out a price sheet to the other uh, proposers. Uh, so we don't think that they did. But at any rate, uh, Paratransit and Store held their price. Uh, American Star, after the interview, came back. Maybe they understood things that we were asking better, came back with a lower price, much more reasonable. Then they were scored. In all cases, with the three uh, reviewers, they came up with the highest score for Store. So we began a negotiation process with Store. And through that, we actually got a few cents off their original price. Um, Solvang uh, came up with an offer to buy the software to do the de demand response uh, simply because we provide offices in Lompoc for the dispatchers, et cetera. So it seemed like a fair deal for both sides. And does that yes. hopefully um, answer how it went? It does, and I just for the public, um, earlier I I received a copy of the entire RFP, which I didn't read, but is placed in the council office, so we have all had an opportunity to read it. But there was one fairly important paragraph in there that describes the process. And you want to paraphrase that paragraph, basically? or Well, I'd like to read it. It's okay. fairly extensive. I think I have it. Yeah, it's the yellow one. Here, we, we, we've got the front. Yeah. Make, make your life easier. We'll just give okay. you one page. Thank you. Because I think, you know, what's involved in that is very important. Okay. Because this then, is, this is, public works things are a little different than, yes, they're, say, they're, a construction they're bid. Yes, they're way different than a re proposals and then a chance to negotiate after you score the one that you think can do the best job. Yes. Um, it reads, the city reserves the right to reject any and all proposals to waive any requirements, both the uh, the cities and those proposed by the bidder to waive any irregularities and informalities and any proposal or the RFP process when it is in the best interest of the city to do so, to negotiate for the modification of any proposal with mutual consent of the bidder, to re-advertise the proposals if desired, 
to sit and act as sole judges of the merit and qualifications of the service offered and to evaluate in its absolute discretion the proposal for each bidder, of each bidder, so as to select the proposal which best serves the requirements of the city, thus ensuring that the best interest of the city of Lompoc, City of Solvang, City of Bulton, County of Santa Barbara will be served. A bidder's past performance, the assurance that it will provide service as stipulated will be taken into consideration as part of the proposal evaluation process. And just to review, scoring was based on the following factors. The ability to perform and meet the requirements of the RFP, 20%. The experience and qualifications of the firm, 20%. The proposed assigned personnel, 25%. Client references, 20%. And price, 15%. And maybe Correct. you could just make a comment about how we kind of evolved into that weighting in a general sense. I think that's uh, scoring that we've used the last two uh, processes. And is it substantially similar to Stoke scoring we use for other things? As far as I know, but we probably would have to have uh, Ray Ambler, who does most of the proposals for other items. It's yeah. close to what we use for uh, RFQs for engineering uh, firms, that sort and of thing. It, it, it seemed familiar from one I read before for Correct. an engineering project. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, City Attorney, is there, with regard to that scoring process, was that reasonable and customary? In, you know, you have experience in other cities, so this is kind of how the game's played in the, in the big world. Every, every RFP has different um, things to consider, so let me put it this way. The, the expectation, my expectation prior to learning this was that price was the big factor, and obviously it's not. So I guess what I'm saying is out there in the world, price is not necessarily the key factor in, in these kinds of things. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's the way it is. Correct. Okay, just making sure. All right. Um, are there any, any other questions? Councilmember Martner. Yes, I'd like to make a comment regarding uh, the price. I, I sure hope that uh, the price is not the main factor, particularly when we're talking about uh, a public service that uh, has a huge public safety aspect to it. <laughs> so uh, we hope that we just don't go for the lower bidder just because. Okay. Councilmember Lingle, do you have any more questions? Councilmember Starbuck, Councilmember Costa, Councilmember Martner. I'm ready to make a motion if the council is ready. Um, no, I wouldn't be able to allow you to, but I would have to let Mr. Bean, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Bean. <laughs> In view of, a, of, of all this, uh, I would like to make one statement. Please, no one in the public or any of you council members or Mayor Lynn construe that the staff of the city of Lompoc thinks in any way that American Star has done a bad job over the last seven, eight years. They've done a good job. And not winning this bid is not based on the staff thinking they're doing a bad job. They've met all their obligations and run Lompoc Transit as best they could. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Martner. I would like to move that the City Council award the contract for the RFP 11 to store transit systems for approximately 4.6 mil over the period of five years and authorize the Mayor to execute the contract. And a second. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for the staff recommendation. Um, Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to take this moment to thank American Star Tours uh, for their service to the city. Thank you very much. Okay, Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Bean for his comment. I think that was very appropriate, and it was, I think, uh, good information for both the council and the community. So thank you, Mr. Bean. Is there any other discussion on behalf of the council? 
Okay, can we vote please? And that passes 5-0. I know this is, uh, this is very difficult and realize that it's difficult for us too. So. And at this point you now have the appeal process because the decision is made. <laughs> Okie doke. Thank you. Yeah. And you have plenty of witnesses that it was timely filed. Okay, and now we have item number 12, an agreement with Kieser Martson Associates, Inc. for economic analysis of the California Space Authority, proposed California Space Center and Business Park from City of Attorney Laurel Barcelona, and looks like we get the dynamic duo. You're going to be in on this, too. Mary, you just called me city attorney. <laughs> so I will Congratulations defer. on your raise and status. I will defer to city attorney Joe Potnoni. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you read two lines at once. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you know, at your council meeting of April 19th, you approved an exclusive negotiation agreement between the city and California Space Authority to begin the negotiation process for the possibility of having a space center um, located in Lompoc. Um, one of the aspects or requirements of that ENA, the Exclusive Negotiation Agreement, is that the CSA, the California Space Authority, has to pr provide in 90 days a pro forma. That 90-day period started to run when the, that agreement was effective, which is April 27th, so those 90 days run on July 26th. What's being suggested this evening is to hire a consultant who has um, a lot of authority and uh, interest and experience in reviewing pro formas for the local governments that try to do development projects. And their uh, history is um, without question, they're, they're a very highly regarded um, ent uh, outfit in the city, in the state of California. And what they'll do is they'll assist with the review and the analysis and the economics of the project, including a discussion of potential secondary benefits that will result from the project. The, person, the, the actual individual from Kaiser Marston Associates, Inc., who would be assisting the city is Kathleen Head, Kathy Head. Um, she's one of the managing part, she's a managing principal of the Los Angeles office. Kaiser Marston has um, three offices at least throughout California, and she happens to be in the Los Angeles office, um, and she's the managing principal. She will be taking the lead for Kaiser Marston to do this analysis. Um, she has extensive background in providing public agencies financial assistance in simple and complex real estate transactions. Your municipal code permits the city actually to ha go through this process, and staff actually has authority to approve this agreement because of the um, the fact that the agreement is, is only for $11,500, but because of the importance of this project to the community and we feel the, the need to have it, um, the public aware of what's going on, we thought it would be a good idea to bring this project, this contract to the city council for approval. And the budgeting for this project, the anticipation is going to be handled through the, your uh, general fund. There will be an amendment that will be coming forward to you to modify the budget. Um, but that's how this money, this um, contract would be funded. Um, so what um, we're recommending is that the council review this item and uh, approve this contract for uh, Kaiser Marston Associates with Kathy Head doing the work to provide the city some economic assistance and analysis for this project. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Mark. Are we first? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying good attention. Okay, Councilmember Martner, you, you've got the gold blouse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to understand uh, the requirements. Uh, your report says the ENA requires CSA to provide a pro forma describing the anticipated financing for the proposed California Space Center. CSA's is required to provide the pro forma. What is it that this 
contracting agency would do for CSA and what is it that would do for the city or is it doing only something for the city? They're only doing work for the city. So um, CSA has a pro forma, I assume. Or I, think they they're prepare, I think they're, they're preparing, preparing a pro forma and this consulting agency will review the pro forma with what in mind specifically? What, what, I, what I'm actually hoping is, and I think this is what um, Kaiser Marston would anticipate, is certainly what I anticipate, is that even before that pro forma gets actually put down on paper, I think it would be very helpful if Kathy Head has a conversation with CSA saying, this is the kind of information that we need to have included in that pro forma so that we're sure that, or the KMA is sure that when they review it, they can give the city council sufficient information to say this project is really possible or you know what it's a pipe dream and it's not worth the time okay now my second question is um, in my experience when we've had similar things like this not necessarily an ENA but let's say we have had um, I take for example the Bailey Avenue um, when the Bailey Avenue proposal for annexation and all the residential proposals that were put into that um, the developers paid and put a lot of money in making a financial and an economic case for the approval of the project. Um, I assume that CSA will make an economic case for approval of the project, not something that we would pay for it. So I still need a clarification of where is the difference. I mean, we, in the past, we have not paid for making an economic case on any projects, as far as I know, or at least at since I've been in the council, I am not aware that the city has paid an organization to make a case for an economic, uh, you know, case for the project so it can be approved. Um, this is the first time, although I'm trying to really get the specific of what is it that you are asking this contracting agency to do. Kaiser Marston Associates isn't going to be preparing the pro forma for CSA. They're not going to be preparing the for, a pro forma for anyone. What they're going to do is they're going to take the information, hopefully, as I said, they'll first have a discussion with CSA saying, this is the kind of material and information that we need you to provide, the financial analysis we need you to provide, so that when we do our analysis, it's a whole sound and complete analysis. And then what Kaiser Marston would do is review that pro forma and advise the city council on whether or not that pro forma makes sense, whether it's based on reality, whether it actually will provide a project that is feasible. Thank you. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do have a few questions. The first is how did we find KMA? Was that via recommendation? It was my recommendation. Well, she's used to like graduates, so you know she's got to be good, but no. <laughs> oh, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so Ms. Martner alluded to something that I was concerned about, and I was wondering if this process had been done um, for that location for the previous project that was surrounding the space industry. If we know, if we have that information, if that was done. Uh, that was a really long time ago. I, I've read a lot of documents to do with it, but I don't think I ever, I, I know financials were prepared back then, but I wasn't a part of it and I honestly don't remember. And I, the documents that we have are somewhat limited in nature because of the amount of time that's passed since 1995, I think was when it kind of went away. Okay. And um, I think the difference with this project is that the, commercial office portion is included in this project to overcome some of the shortfalls that they had with that project for a long-term revenue stream, number one. Number two, the other tie-ins were that it would provide um, mentoring and um, stuck on apprentice again, but the word that you use in an, in an office environment where you have, you come in and and you participate and learn in the office environment and also that the the office environment of these corporations 
would be there to inspire the students and have their own little thing and also that they would be there to, to help provide instructors for some of the classes as part of their participation. So I think it was designed to overcome some of the some of the issues from before. Right, and I understand that until they present the performa, that's all speculation. So I, I definitely understand that there's differences. Um, now, I believe you mentioned this is not a required cost. This is not any requirement on the city to do this kind of work or to consult with this, um, to, do any, to, to get this as a product. The, the city is not obligated to enter into this contract. Is that what you're asking? Right. The city is not obligated to. However, my recommendation would be to do it because, um, and maybe the city administrator may want to talk to this, I think it will, it will be a, an assistance that will be beneficial to the city, and I'm not sure that I, I, I know that the city doesn't have on staff someone who would be able to do this analysis. The city um, has used another firm for housing projects and community um, CDBG type projects. Um, I, I haven't worked with them. I, I didn't actually talk to them. I know this firm does complex real estate transactions throughout the state. Okay, and then I also wanted to confirm that that 11500 would be coming from the general fund. Yes. Okay, so that's sort of where my biggest concern comes in at this point. We're paying this individual $11,500 for what is approximately 41 hours of work. Um, so just to put that in perspective, you know, we're trying to cl close a budget gap. And so any money spent is money gone, essentially. Uh, and that's sort of my concern. I understand the benefit of this, um, but I also think that we're five able-bodied and minded individuals who can review a pro forma as well. Thank you. It was... Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah. Um, it, you know, in a sense, before you go investing a bunch of time and money, I, I think that maybe the 41 hours that they do would save us considerable. So, I mean, I may be a, a wash on that. But what, what I'm more curious about is, is it says including potential secondary benefits. What, what is the intent of that? Are they going to – is this the ripple effect into the Lompoc economy, or, or what – is that what that is, basically? Let the record show that the city attorney nodded up and down <laughs> in complete violation of anything he ever lets me do. <laughs> Councilmember Lingle. Yeah, I just want to, I'll agree with uh, Councilmember Starbuck, even though, and Councilmember Costa, that we possibly jointly have the ability to review a pro forma. I think our fiduciary responsibility is to make sure that before we fully put ourselves into this agreement um, that we get all the facts on the table. And I'm glad to see $11,000, even though it's, it's a chunk of money, for the size of this project, to, for me to feel good about going forward with this project in the future, I think it's, it's a real bargain. Not that you know, you know, we're going to increase the price. But um, I, when I read this the first time, I saw something in here where, and I can't see it now again, where this is going to evaluate the realistic, realistic, realistically that CSA has the ability to raise the funds. Did I see that in here originally when I read this? I don't remember if that specifically um, language was there, but that's one of the things that they would be analyzed to make sure that it, it, the project is a reality. Okay. Because I'm assuming their pro forma is going to say that's one of the aspects of how it's going to be financed. So one of the analyses will be to verify how that's really going to happen. Because that's one of my, well, one of my concerns, and it's been mentioned several times, you know, where are they going to get the money? I mean, the last time they were here, Councilmember Martner had asked them specifically, how much money have you raised so far? And it was basically nothing that they've raised so far. So um, it is a concern, and I'm hoping that this contract that we signed, if we sign this contract, that it will look at the, Realistically, are they going to be able to raise this money? So, thank you. That would be one of the functions that I see them assisting with. Councilmember Martner. Uh, yes, under the agreement for the consultant services, a scope of services under two, it says provide an evaluation of the proposed project's financial feasibility. Um, you know, I, I understand Councilmember Costa's concern. Um, 
However, uh, if we are going to engage in, um, you know, going into a real estate negotiation that has members of this community not, um, you know, quite happy about it, I think we owe them absolute due diligence uh, that if we're going to move forward, we have facts on the table that says this organization can do it or cannot do it. This organization has the management, you know, skills to do it or not do it, has the financial uh, backup and credibility and track record. All of that has to be uh, evaluated in this contract uh, by this consultant. If it is not, then the $11,000 are not worth it, <laughs> okay? If it is, and he provides us with really very solid facts either way, whether it's gonna go or not go, I think it is worth $11,000, and it will remove our own personal biases, whether we like the project, don't like the project, whether you know certain sectors of the Lompoc residents like the project or don't like the project. So um, I am inclined to um, go with a consultant, having very clear that we need facts and we need to um, make sure that those facts are stated very clearly, either pro or against uh, moving on into the real estate uh, negotiations. Okay, I think I'll take a break here and ask if we have any public comment, anyone in the audience who would like to weigh in on this subject. Seeing none of you rise, all 200 of you, I bring it back to council and um, can I get a little bite on this before you start in? Because I, I kind of want to play off what Councilman sure. Martin said. Um, yeah, I, I I have the benefit of having read their other performa. No, that's not true. I have the benefit of having skimmed their other performa, and it was way past me. And I'm a I'm a decent business study. Um, we need some help. I do have one concern here in that Catherine Head's headshot is blank, and so we uh, we may not know what she looks like, but we know her qualifications. So, and now Council Member Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, that was just a concern. Definitely not a decision maker. I understand the magnitude of this project, and this is why, in this instance, it. It does seem more um, of a necessity than with other projects, and I definitely understand that. Um, I wish there was public here to comment. I have a feeling that um, there we will be getting some disgruntled citizens with this decision. I just want to make that clear. Um, but I, I think that you're correct, Councilmember Lingle, that with um, something that could affect the city on this scale, it's a small investment on the front end. Um, and Councilmember Starbuck was correct; that can save funds in, in the long run, especially if their pro forma. Uh, does not prove that they can fund, then that saves us all of that time, energy, and money that we would put into figuring that out eventually and be stagnant as we were uh, with that property previously. So um, thank you for the discussion, and I just want to put that forth. Thank you. And I think the other thing that I'm encouraged with is um, our city attorney's comment that our, that um, Keezer, Mar Marston, will chat with the CSA in advance and tell them what it is that they need to have so that we get it all done right the first time because there's nothing worse than going all the way down the road and having the wrong information come in and we, we want to do this in a timely manner. Um, is there anyone else who would like to comment on that? Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, part of, I, this kind of just came to my brain, part of what we do here is, is definitely a, a policy setting a group of individuals and so I'm curious if because uh, I'm thinking from the standpoint of a citizen at this point um, you know do we have any policy that could set the guidelines for when and or when we should not allow a con or a contractor to come in for these services I'm just curious if because it seems so ambiguous not that it was a bad idea but almost that that idea came up because we thought it was a good idea not because it's actually set in policy and I was just curious if that's something that um, the council is interested in talking about or, or or if that is even a possibility um, to talk about okay. in a more, you know, I guess set in stone way of doing things instead of such an ambiguous way of doing things. Let me um, 
Let me share something that I recall the city attorney saying, and then he can take off with it, is that because this is a real estate negotiation and the parallel that I, I think in the conversation was RDA real estate and that this is a kind of a common method in with regard to that. So why don't you why don't you pick up that ball and run with it? I think what the mayor is referring to is when um, communities actively pursue trying to get redevelopment moving in their communities, they and they get developers come in who are interested in doing something in their community. The developers provide the city of pro forma or the agency in that case of pro forma in order for the agency to understand what um, funding gap the agency may have to fund and that's I'm not suggesting that there's going to be a funding gap that the city is going to be anticipating funding here but it's that analysis that's used to see whether the the numbers that the developers relying on to prove to try to convince the agency that they have to submit have to provide some financial assistance the Kaiser Marston is well versed in reviewing all of that construction data purchase of property data realist um, lease lease rate data um, the likelihood of the individuals who are being pursued as the possible tenants whether there's a reality that they'll be coming whether there is a market in the bigger field for that kind of a use that's the kind of analysis that's done typically for a redevelopment project that a community is trying to put forward and I see this as very similar to that although again it's not because the analysis is being done to get um, to find out what the city's financial participation should be however one of the analyses will include the the um, there's value to the land that is involved and there has to be some cost um, in purchasing that land and deciding what that cost should be in order to assist to make the project go forward is another analysis that will be part of what Kaiser Morrison does in reviewing their pro forma because I'm sure their pro forma is going to come back saying this is what we think the land is worth. Councilmember Martner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, the, 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 the concept of a policy is, is an interesting one. Um, the, the council has been criticized many times in the past for hiring too many consultants for this and that. Um, and we don't have the in-house uh, expertise to be able to evaluate these things. Um, having seen some of the monies that have been spent for RDA and the failure of not seeing any projects to success, I think it's actually a good idea to do an independent evaluation of these pro formas. Uh, I mean, I can bring many examples that are very painful to all of us, like the downtown revitalization and other things that didn't happen. Nevertheless, we did spend the money. Um, if we would have done this kind of due diligence in those, maybe we would not have awarded those funds. So maybe there is something to be said about uh, doing this. So I appreciate it that actually was brought forward. Councilmember Costa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My effort was just to ensure that in future cases such as this one, um, we, yeah, we're allowed, you know, the flexibility of, of using a consultant as an option rather than, you know, or if, or if need be in certain cases, limit ourselves, but somehow set some kind of, um, you know, the, some kind of road that we can follow uh, as to a policy on that. That was just what I was curious about, but I agree. Thank you. Okay, is there any other discussion from the council? Um, seeing none, I'd accept a motion. Yeah, we, I did that. Yeah. I looked out there and nobody would come and talk. Um, Councilmember Lingle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that we approve the agreement with Kaiser Martston Associates in a not to exceed amount of $11,500 and it'll authorize the city administrator to sign the agreement on the behalf of the city. And a second. I'll go ahead and second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the staff recommendation. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, could we vote please? And that passes 5-0.
Now, I'd like to move to number 13, but I promised um, Linda that we wouldn't take this up until 1130. So we're going to call a recess. Uh, just kidding, Linda. I thought it was one. <laughs> <laughs> um, honorable Chair, Board Members, Staff is before you tonight to present a funding request of $500,000 from West Point Homes Incorporated to assist 11 affordable units in their, single fa in their single family housing project, now known as Laurel Crossing. It's located within the Old Town Redevelopment Project area at Laurel Avenue and V Street. This project was previously known as Crown Laurel Housing Development. The agency proposes to assist this project by making two loans to West Point Homes Incorporated. The first loan will be in the amount of $285,000 at 0% interest, which is the same amount provided to the previous developer, Crown Laurel LLC. These funds were unexpectedly repaid in September of 2010 when the initial developer was unable to move forward with the development. The agency proposes to assist the new developer with the same loan amount and terms. The loan will be funded from the Affordable Housing Incentive Program, which was created to give developers an incentive to develop affordable housing within the project area. The second loan will be a $215,000 loan uh, construction loan at 0% interest that will be set up similar to a construction line of credit and repaid and redrawn to assist the construction of the 11 affordable units in the development. The loan will be drawn and repaid during construction of the affordable units and will be repaid from the sale of the affordable units. West Point Homes Incorporated in 1994 and has been building homes in Southern California ever since. They have successfully built and sold homes in several housing tracts in Palmdale, Moore Park, Calabasas, Camarillo, Thousand Oaks, and Newberry Park, to name a few. The principals of the corporation seem to have the experience, knowledge, and financial resources to allow them to complete this project with the agency's assistance. The production of these units will benefit the area with an attractive, fully taxable housing project. The project will also produce tax increment for years to come while providing area residents with home ownership opportunities. These loans will additionally assist in relieving the agencies of its current excess surplus condition. Staff recommends that the board approve a $285,000 affordable housing incentive loan and a $215,000 loan from the Housing Revolving Loan Fund, totaling $500,000 in set-aside funding to West Point Homes Incorporated and authorize the executive director or her designee to execute all documents required to execute the loan or provide a staff um, other direction as appropriate. This concludes my report for this evening. Mr. James Rasmussen is in the audience and is available to answer any questions you might have about the project. Okay. Mr. Rasmussen, would you like to share a few words with us? Hi, I'm James Rasmussen, president of West Point Homes. Glad to be here. Okay, now we have written communications. Are there any written communications? We have an opportunity for public oral communications. Two minutes. Mm, oops, sorry. Oh, yes. Oof. It's good. I was going to get it in the next section, but I can get it on this one. This is another, another letter that I have to pass out. Except you're not going to get one, Dirk, because you're going to read with me. Pass it over to Bob. And um, this is with this is my um, report pursuant to the Health and Safety Code Section 33130. 
And this report is provided pursuant to California Health and Safety Codes 33130, effective May 16th, 2011. I've entered into a month-to-month -month rental agreement for property at 104 West Ocean Avenue. This is my corporation. The terms of that rental agreement are substantially equivalent to the terms of a rental agreement available to any member of the general public for compatible property in the project area. I actually paid more. The rental agreement prohibits me from subletting, subleasing, or assigning the property at any rental rate. I will be using the property for storing materials, equipment, and other personal property for resale in conjunction with one of my principal businesses, which is liquidation. And this is inventory that I'm transferring from a warehouse in Santa Maria that's been sold and we're being evicted. Um, in a previous letter dated March 25th, 2011, I updated the status of my interest in a property located at 118 West Ocean Avenue. The current status of that interest is the same as indicated in that letter. However, the property owner has commissioned an additional structural engineer's report and may be making some improvements so that the property will permit our corporation pursuing the occupancy of the property and that would be the wine center. As required by law and good government, I will continue to abstain from making, from making, participating in making, or in any way using or attempting to use my official position of influence, of influence a government decision if it is reasonably foreseeable that the decision will have a material financial effect on any of those properties or my interest in any of those properties, which is distinguishable from its effect on the general public. Please receive and file this. And so everyone has a copy. There's yours. Yeah, I need a uh, I need a motion to receive. So moved. And a second. To receive and file my letter. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to receive and file my letter. Is there any discussion? And could we vote on that, please? Do I vote? I vote. Okay. And that passes five to zero. No, I was going to make a comment. I was going to say if we vote no, you ha can you still buy the property? No, no, it's a rental. Rental. It's okay. a rental. Okay, and the next one is an item I wanted to pass out. Um, I serve on SB CAG, and this is a staff report that deals with the fare box revenue for the city of Lompoc and a, a um, reduction that we received. And I'm not going to explain the whole thing. I'm just going to give it to you guys. And this would have to do with the transit report that we didn't review tonight. So this is for future reading. And this is just an SB CAG document, which is available on the SB CAG website for all of those of you at home. It is the December 16th meeting, and it is item 6G. And if anyone in the audience is dying for a copy, I have a couple spares. And somebody on the end is dying for a copy. OK, and now. Let's go around once and make our reports. Councilmember Martin, would you like to start? Um, I don't think I have anything to report, or if I do, I've forgotten by now. <laughs> Sorry. Councilmember Costa? I went to a ton of meetings. <laughs> I mean, I think the most exciting was um, I was one of the judges at the Cabrillo High School Senior Projects uh, presentation, and so I was part of, you know, I would say almost close to 100 different judges who came to judge the students and the senior projects, and so that was great and supportive and, and uh, a wonderful opportunity. Otherwise, it was just a ton of meetings. <laughs> Councilmember Lingle? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I attended an NCPA meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, from May 8th through May 12th. To the best of my knowledge, we had no money spent out of ge uh, the general fund. However, I have not completed my report. And I, if, I, if there was any general fund money, I'll report that next time. Also, yesterday I attended a Old Town uh, market meeting over at the Chamber of Commerce. And that was it. Councilmember Starbuck? Uh, I have nothing to report. Uh, I would report that by my count in the last two weeks, I've been to 23 events or meetings. Um, there is one thing that might have been something to do with the city expense. I did ride with Chief Jeff States to the um, 
local officials, officials all hazardness preparedness seminar provided by FEMA. The, the seminar was free, but we did have to put gas in the uh, city car to get there, and he was nice enough to haul me down. Um, that was really a pretty eye-opening seminar, and I have left the document in the office so all the council members can take a read through it. And we did a number of workshop activities to try to get a grasp on, you know, disaster planning and what you do. And it was interesting for Jeff because just having assumed the position, this was his first trip to this to that particular seminar. So I, um, when the city administrator advised me that I needed to go to this, I was a little less than enthusiastic at killing a day, but I think it was a good investment. Um, and then I would like to report that I have the best job ever as mayor. There is no question about that because I got to do the Water Wise Awards for the art contest that you all saw hanging around City Hall and I got hugs from all kinds of nice little kids and handshakes and thank yous and I'll do it again next week if you want to run it again. That was the most fun ever and I also had a, a number of meetings over the last two weeks with the CSA um, chatting with them about issues and um, making suggestions on who they should go see to, to uh, advance their project and um, I'd like to announce that as on an interim basis the, um, the Chumash tribe had donated $25,000 to the CSA to help them with some of their um, requirements for processing the plan. So we want to thank the Chumash tribe for coming in and helping. And that's all I have to say. Is there anyone else has anything else? Councilmember Lingle. Mr. Mayor, um, I just have one announcement as well. The Turduck and Dinner Group is doing a fundraiser for our library. I just happen to have tickets here. It, this is, uh, is a little departure from our normal event. We normally hold a formal dinner uh, sometime in November, $100 a plate very well attended and we usually raise anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars for the library. Due to the economy this year we did not hold the event so we've decided to do a somewhat downscale. This is a wine appetizers gourmet oven roasted pizza at the Clopepe Vineyards. If you've never been to the Clopepe Vineyards it's a fantastic estate over there. Tickets are $65, and all the proceeds, again, go to the Lompoc, Vandenberg, and Buellton libraries. So anyone interested in tickets, contact me or in one of the Traducans, I guess. Thank you. Is there anything else we need to add? Okay, we stand adjourned to the Lompoc. Uh, Mr. Oops, Mayor, sorry. Council, uh, oral communications. No, I did that. You did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Nobody stood I up. I, was... I offered it. Um, so we stand adjourned to the Lompoc Council Redevelopment Agency. Oh, no, that's right. Never mind. Back up. Uh, I think we agreed to, so we should go do it. It'll just take a few minutes. And huh? I'd have a concern with that. Okay, so we're going to be off to closed session for a few minutes, and if you guys want to hang out, we'll be back one more time.